Submitting to the Demon by Celeste King, a dark fantasy romance novel. Chapter 1. Natalie. I shrink in my seat, casting a glance at the behemoth of a demon sitting across from me. His long, silvery hair sways slightly with every movement of the carriage, nearly blending in against the milky white hue of his skin. He could be beautiful, if it weren't for the towering crown of horns atop his head, or his obsidian eyes, with no whites to speak of. I don't dare look at him for too long, unsure of whether he's looking at me or out the window. He hasn't made more than a passing remark since I was dragged out of the fetid dungeons by the nightmarish creatures at the higher demon's command, only casting a cursory glance over the gathered human women before hauling me from the line. After that, everything was a blur. I was dragged from the rest of the humans and down the halls of the palace. I wanted to kick, to scream, to do something to prevent myself from becoming the sordid plaything of this frightening creature. But my mind and my body were on two different wavelengths. Instead, the demon's huge hand left bruises on my arm, and I tripped over my own feet as I cried silently, my muscles atrophied from the time spent in those cramped, foul cells. I couldn't even find the words when he gave me the opportunity to speak. At least this one looks vaguely humanoid, I think to myself bleakly as I steal another glance at the demon. The carriage jolts, and his hair bounces, revealing elegantly pointed ears that send a bolt of pain through me. Between the high set of his features and the pointed ears, he bears a vague resemblance to Toklis. Toklis, my dear sweet Toklis. Ever since the day the demons destroyed our work camp, I can't even think his name without remembering his last moments, our last moments together. Toklis was a Zagfa, with little magic and less social standing, tasked to help run the work camp I was a slave in. I had been scared of him at first, as any human woman was of the dark elf handlers who presided over us, but his innate kindness softened me to him. He wasn't like many of the other dark elves. He was gentle and thoughtful. He wanted a better world, not just for the elves of Pratheca, but for the humans too. Toklis always talked about the unfairness of the caste system and the use of human slaves, and pointed to examples like Amelie and Archduke Kralishiraya, saying that they were paving the way for a new, kinder world for us all and then the demons slaughtered him. I was with him when the storm struck and the demons fell from the sky. The entire camp went mad, humans and elves alike fleeing and screaming. Toklis tried valiantly to hide me from them, ushering me beneath his bed and warning me to stay quiet. The demon that crashed his way into Toklis's cottage was a brute, a massive obsidian nightmare with flaming horns and gleaming armor only adding to his unimaginable bulk. Toklis fought him, doing everything he could to fend the demon off. It only distracted the demon for so long. As soon, it tired of Toklis's fighting, the demon crushed his skull between two massive paws. The squelching of blood, snapping of bone, and the horrid, wet whistling noise that came from Toklis's exposed larynx still haunts my dreams. All I could see from beneath the bed that Toklis and I had shared so often was the mess of flesh and brain that had once been my lover's head. If I hadn't been in that God's damned cottage and hadn't hid like a coward, Toklis might still be alive. His death was my fault. The thought, however recurring, threatens to send me into a tailspin in the carriage, turning my breathing ragged as I grip the edge of the seat so hard my knuckles turn white. No, I tell myself. It wasn't my fault. It was Laura's. Laura was the one who led the demons to our camp, encouraged them to steal us and breed with us, to bear the horrifying demon spawn. She sold us out, sold out her own sister and people to these veritable beasts. Cora, at least, had tried to fight the demons, had stayed with the rest of us in those awful cages, while the animal-like monstrosities starved us, and denied us of water if only to see how long we could last without it. Cora and I had never been close at the work camp, not really, but our time in those dungeons forged a bond not unlike sisterhood. I trusted her, was comforted by her, until she abandoned us too, leaving us for a demon just like her sister did. I shake my head, as if I could rid myself of the memories that plague me. It does me no good to reflect on everything that's happened. It does nothing to change where I am or where I'm going. Another glance at the demon who seems to have claimed me makes me freeze, panic locking up my muscles as I stare at him. This time there's no doubt that the demon is looking at me. Taking in his entire countenance, I realise there are small, strange markings along the skin of his cheeks and forehead, runes of some sort that are only a shade lighter than the rest of his skin. 
and only add to his fearsome appearance. I'm not sure what to do. Should I look away? Should I hold his gaze? The other demons hated when we talked back or looked them in the eye, and would beat us for even the smallest infraction. I dropped my gaze on an unsteady breath, earning a derisive snort from my new overseer. A flash of anger courses through me, but I quell it quickly. Any kind of temper, any kind of rebellion at all can spell death for a human in this place. If I'm to survive, I need to keep my head down. I can't help but wonder, however, what my newest master will be like. The demons who kept us in the prison were different, hardly humanoid at all and cruel beyond all imagining, even compared to the worst of the dark elves at the work camps. Will he be like them? A part of me hopes he will be kinder, but that hope dwindles as a frightening spire-like structure looms outside of the carriage. The black stone of the imposing building jut out of the red earth like a rogue stalagmite, the land before it dotted with strange plants of glassy blacks and gleaming golds and silvers. My eyes burn as the full weight of my new situation slams into me. There is absolutely nothing familiar or comforting about anything here. Not the buildings, or their inhabitants. Even the soil is the wrong colour. The carriage slows to a stop directly in front of the building, the sense of impending doom crushing all of the air from my lungs. A path stretches from the carriage up to the building, and a squat demon appears before me, swinging the door open wide. The demon across from me exits the carriage first, a predatory grace colouring his every movement. For a moment, I'm frozen in place, unsure of what I'm expected to do next. With a huff of annoyance, the demon catches me by the arm, yanking me from the carriage. A small yelp escapes me at the sharp movement, and I could swear that the demon rolls his eyes before he forces me to face him fully. I expect you to be silent and obedient during your stay in my home, he growls, his low, gravelly voice radiating through me. This is my domain and I will not tolerate any wailing. You will not make a sound out of turn if you know what's good for you. Do you understand? I can't help the silent tears that overflow. I've been a slave all my life, and have long since grown accustomed to my place on Pratheka. And yet somehow this demon's statement has my knees knocking together. He releases my arm as if repulsed by my reaction, turning on his heel and striding up the path towards the house. I remain rooted in place, staring after him, my face still wet with tears until the squat demon, a servant I assume, appears in my field of vision. This way, comes his grizzled high voice, inclining his head towards the spire. I don't dare refuse, too frightened to disobey. I follow the path, trying my hardest to keep my chin from wobbling as I enter the building. He leads me up a set of narrow steps that makes me stumble, and a few twists and turns later, the demon opens a door. Here he says. I'm practically shoved into the room beyond before the door closes again, the finality of the sound echoing throughout the room. The room itself is terribly well furnished, pale blue walls with sharp black accents. A large four-poster bed sits in the centre, the rest of the room taken up by two overstuffed armchairs and a small desk. Nothing like the cell in which I've spent the last couple of months, or my lodgings at the work camp before that. It would make it so much easier to despise the place if it weren't so... nice. My tears come harder as I collapse onto the bed. Even surrounded by such finery, I can't help but feel like more of a prisoner now than I ever have. At least in the work camp, I knew that I could escape the advances of a dark elf if I played by certain rules, especially with Toklas as my protector. But here, my only purpose is to be used and traded. There will be no escape. Chapter 2 Kazeth Humans I scoff to myself as I stride through the manor's doors. My steps echo down the dim halls, only adding to the cacophony clanging around in my skull. I can't pretend to understand King Asmodeus's reasoning behind bringing them here. While the preservation of the demon race is of the utmost importance, surely there's a more... appealing race we could breed with. Humans are fragile, fickle beings their lifespans comprising of only decades rather than centuries. From what I've seen, they're as weak mentally as they are physically, and seem to have no true skill. They have no magic, no strength, and no real intelligence. I sigh, suppressing the urge to return to my rooms for the remainder of the day. 
whether I approve of the king's decision or not, holds no bearing. The king has ordered that we breed with the humans, and while the idea of taking the filthy, wide-eyed human girl by force is distasteful at best, I have no choice. She's clearly terrified, despite the fact that my manor is one of the nicer estates in Tealith. I'd have half a mind to be offended by her reaction if she was capable of higher thought. But as an animal, I suppose she just doesn't know any better. I've done nothing to the human. I've already shown her more kindness than the king's guards ever would. And yet she blubbers and weeps at every opportunity. I'm unable to keep the scowl off of my face as the main hall opens before me. I'm about to settle into my favorite armchair by the fireplace when I notice half of a pastry stuffed into the gap between the arm and seat. I growl, plucking the pastry up and brushing the crumbs off of the seat with nimble fingers. I was so lost in thought walking into the room that I didn't notice the complete and utter mess my nieces made of the space. The small dining table is littered with half-eaten food and torn out pages from books, bits of scratch paper and cursory drawings scribbled over the surface. Ink wells are toppled over by the edge of the table, staining the petrified wood and the carpet below it. No doubt the product of Tenulia growing tired of her newest hobby. Alincia must have been in the process of making a fort, because half of the furniture is pushed together in an off-kilter circle, sheets and towels stretched over the top of tables and chairs. The flowers that had once been in a vase by the window are now shoved through new holes in the sheets, and I'm horrified when I realize that she destroyed the bedding I'd commissioned from Asmodeus's own bedmaker. A stack of first edition tomes are scattered on the nearby end table, several of them toppling face first onto the floor, various pages bent and torn by Valindra's careless hands. While a part of me is glad she's attempting to study, I cringe at the damage that's been done to the works that are part of my personal, prestigious collection. Those girls are lucky they're not here right now, I seethe, as I snatch up the books, smoothing out the pages with a little cantrip. What is the point of having anything nice if the girls destroy everything they touch? My fingers absent-mindedly trace the charm I wear around my neck, bearing the sigil of Nitya, the goddess of chaos. Be careful what you wish for, I think to myself, imagining the looks on their faces when I send them to their rooms and forbid them from sweets for the next week, only offers a small amount of gratification as I clean up the tempest they left behind. I don't know how my sister would have handled them if she were still alive. I wish she could see them now. She'd be so proud of them, mess and all. I miss Dranatha every day, and I know the girls do too, even if they only remember her through stories. When she succumbed to the fading a year after they were born, caring for the girls naturally fell to me. It's an extreme rarity for any demon woman to bear more than one child in their lifetime, much less to bear three, and all future matrons. Twin and triplet are common in our family, which explains why Asmodeus tasked me out to find a human woman with such urgency. Regardless, I have enough to deal with as it is. Adding another child to the fray, even if it were my own blood, feels akin to a drowning Zonak asking for more water. Besides... If she has a cognizant thought in her little mind, I doubt the human woman is all that eager to bear my children. The thought saddens me, although I'm not entirely sure why. Children are meant to be a joy, not a duty. I move about the sitting room, gathering up the half-eaten food and refuse, rearranging the furniture and putting the whole room to rights. It's only after I've been cleaning for an hour that I blink with a slow realization. Where in the Seven's name are the Zonak? I drop everything and storm toward the servants' quarters, cursing them internally. That room had to have been in shambles for half the morning, at least, and yet nothing has been done about it. In fact, the only time I've seen either of them all day is at the carriage. The two Zonak have proven to be markedly more useless than a nest of hibernating howler beasts. I only hired them at Alencia's request, after listening to her moan and groan about the state of the house. I suggested that she and her sisters could rectify the issue by cleaning up after themselves, seeing as the house was never such a mess when I lived here alone. But of course, having them clean up after themselves is out of the question. My temper flares as I round the corner into the common room between the two Zonak's bedrooms to find them both lounging. One Zonak is passed out on a spare chaise, his mouth stretched wide, 
drool dripping onto the plush fabric and down his tunic. The other Zonak is playing a solo game of cards at the dining table, and at least has the good sense to jump to his feet as I enter the room. A moment too late. I loosen the rein I hold on my magic and it flares. Terror dawn on the rising Zonak's face as my magical aura pulses around me, swallowing the nearby light. Sparks dart around my fingertips as I fling them towards the two indolent servants. The conscious of the two tries to evade the sparks as if they were mere embers from a fire. Fool, I think to myself with a sneer. The sparks latch onto their target, stinging him like angry hornets, his yelps reverberating down the hall as he sprints away, the seat of his pants smoking. Just as he's out of my line of vision, I hear a small choking noise from the Zonak on the chaise, as Drool gets caught in his shriek at being awoken to the stinging sparks. I bark out a laugh as he hits the ground hard, batting uselessly at the magic as he scrambles to his feet. The next time the two of you shirk your responsibilities, you'll realize what a kindness these sparks are. I snarl at him as he bounds from the room, howling when one of the sparks finds its mark on his wrinkled gray flesh. In the silence of the common room, my amusement fades. I've never cared for having servants, partly because they're unreliable, but mostly because I dislike needing to dole out punishments when they inevitably fall short of my expectations. Dark Elf servants have become increasingly popular since our arrival to Protheca. They're fitted with magic collars that claim to wipe their memories and cripple whatever magical ability they may have had in their previous lives. I've considered trading in the Zonak for a few, but I dislike the idea of elves in my home even more than useless demons. Where humans are useless, lowly animals, dark elves are cruel, vindictive creatures. I don't trust a collar to keep them from their true nature. I sigh, rubbing my temples to try and dispel the brutal headache growing there. There's simply too much on my plate these days. The triplets and all their messes. King Asmodeus's newest orders. The persistent duties of a Sazgaroth trying to keep my estate running. Adding a new guest to the equation is nothing short of a nightmare, not to mention needing to keep the estate fit for a guest, with nothing but two useless Zonax to rely on. I shake my head, chiding myself for my train of thought. She's a human. I doubt she'd so much as notice a mess, much less care. I'm not sure why I even bothered. The only standard that matters is mine or the king's, I remind myself as I stalk off toward the dining room. The girls will be home soon, and I should at least ensure that the space is fit to eat in and that food is actually prepared for when they return home. I have half a mind to feed the human girl as well, but I'm worn so thin that I can't trust myself to be patient if the pathetic creature bursts into tears again. It's going to be a long day, I think, bracing myself for the girl's impending return. Chapter 3. Natalie. If I wasn't so accustomed to being uncomfortable, I'm sure my back would be aching by now. Maybe it is, and I've forgotten what it is like to relax. I've been sitting on the bed, curled into the corner farthest from the door, since I was left alone here. My knees are pressed against my chest, and my arms have been locked around my shins so long that they are too stiff to move. I haven't dared to try, though. I've been afraid to breathe, much less explore the room I've been shoved into. I don't know what to make of that monster who has claimed me, and I keep hoping that if I curl up enough, he just may forget me. Unfortunately, my body refuses to allow that to happen. As quiet as I've been, my stomach gurgles as if to remind me and the rest of the world that I am, in fact, alive and kicking. A whine escapes me, and it grumbles louder. Could you shut up? I ask. I'd been blaming my terrible headache on all the stress of it all but I'm starting to realise that my dizziness and the weakness of my limbs have less to do with fear and more to do with desperate hunger. It's been so long since I've eaten. The demons forgot to feed me before I was taken away. More like they didn't see the point in wasting food, I think bitterly. Still, I need to eat eventually, and as afraid as I am, I don't think my new master will like it very much if I pass out from hunger. With my heart pounding in my chest, I pry my limbs out of the uncomfortable position. They're shaking, and again, I can't tell if it's from how badly my body needs food or how terrified I am at the demon's reaction. Both, most likely. Gritting my teeth, 
I cross the room and ease open the door. I half expect to see him on the other side, demanding to know what I'm doing. But as I linger in the doorway and hear no one approaching, I take a chance and step out. I creep down the stairs, and only once I start to curve toward what must be the main living area, I hear voices. I can't quite make out what they're saying as I freeze on the bottom step, close enough to realise that whoever it is, it's not him. I edge closer, keeping my steps silent as I take note that it's not just one female. It sounds like two or three. How many women does this demon have? No, 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 I don't think you saw, one woman says. Oh, I saw, another interrupts. Clearly not if you don't agree. You must be absolutely blind, the first one argues. Or you're just idiotic, the second one snaps. I make it to the edge of the hall, and with a daring gulp, I peek around the corner. I'm shocked at the sight before me. There are three girls, not demon women, but actually girls that look younger than me, lounging in the living space. There's food piled on the table between them that they are devouring. I wince involuntarily at the sight of more demons. Oh, hush you two. You both are pushing it too far. I haven't heard this one speak, but she has an air about her that tells me she is the eldest. Her back is to me, and somehow the other two don't seem to notice as they continue to shout over each other. You weren't even there, the first girl argues again. Why do you always think you're right? The second girl says, irritated. The oldest relaxes into the chaise she's on. Aren't you more intrigued about what Rochelle said? One of the others rolls her eyes. You believe her? The third one sits up, leaning toward the others. I think they're sisters. They all look alike. But maybe that's just because I've never seen a female demon before. You don't. Rachel always has the best gossip. I hear her sister is in with one of the King's Sosgoroths. Either way, I don't doubt the king is looking to land on Pratheka. I just wonder what he'll do after the attack. The oldest one's answers are so measured. Enslave the dark elves, the one with yellow eyes shouts, crashing back and giggling as she says it. Who knows, the third one huffs as she lounges back. I'm ready to be on the ground, though. Imagine having a whole world. It must be so much better than this boring island. I have to stifle a scoff. These girls are lounging in a lavish home, eating what looks to be delectable food that makes my stomach growl again, and they are complaining about the boredom. My mouth waters as I watch the yellow-eyed one pluck another slice of bread and jam off a platter. I want to eat so bad, but my body quakes at the idea of stepping forward. I know that I will faint at the rate I'm going, but it seems to be better than facing the three of them. I suck in a deep breath, forcing my foot up, and just as it touches the ground, I spin around. There's no way that I'm going in that room with them, and I'm in such a rush to get away, I don't even pay attention to my surroundings. I make it two steps before I slam into something solid that I swear wasn't there before. Stumbling back, I realise why. There's a massive body in front of me. I swallow hard as I glance up to see the face of the very demon I've been avoiding. A shudder rushes through me, and I have no idea what to do, not that I have much time to figure it out. He catches my shoulders when I try to put distance between us, and at first I fear he's trying to grab me. When I register the surprise on his face, just before the mask of irritation returns, I realise he was trying to steady me. But his fingers dig into my shoulders as his lips curl up into a snarl so soft and terrifying, I don't think the three girls in the room next to us even hear him. What are you doing in the hall? I want to answer him. I'm not being purposefully difficult. It's just that as I stare at his face, which is sharp and has harsh markings that make him appear more frightening than I remember, my jaw hangs open slightly as I stare up at him and my pulse picks up. His jaw tightens. I think he might be trying to show restraint with me because he doesn't yell or beat me. I can tell he's growing frustrated though and just as I try to calm myself enough to explain that I am absolutely starving, a zap of electricity runs through the air that makes my mouth snap shut. I asked you he grinds out. A question. My eyes widen as pulses of energy radiate off of him, and the longer I remain silent, the worse his magic gets. It starts to audibly crackle, sparks flying around his frame, and I wince as I fear one will cut into my flesh of its own accord. Fierce lines of magic blast around him. It's like his own personal lighting storm to accentuate his mood, and as the magic flashes over his face, it only highlights the fierceness of his features. My self-preservation kicks in right about then, and I don't even make the conscious decisions to flee. 
Something about staring up at a massive, powerful demon that can conjure his own storm sends me fleeing. I'm not even sure how I've managed to tear free of him, but I don't think too hard about it as I scramble up the steps. My chest is heaving as I round the corner into my bedroom, and I slam the door behind me. Throwing my body against it, I lock it and keep my back pressed to the heavy wood. I know that if the demon wants, he could barge in, but I feel a little better putting some distance between his magic and me. I sink to the floor, and though hunger tightens my stomach, food is the furthest thing from my mind. I don't think I could even eat right now with the way that the fear is turning my stomach. What am I going to do when I can't face this demon? I'm also curious about the girls downstairs. He doesn't seem like the fatherly type, but I don't see another reason they are here. I'm so dizzy from all the thoughts racing through my head, and my heart is pounding so hard in my ears that I can't hear anything over it. As I curl back up into my little ball, I beg all the gods there ever were to just give me one moment of peace. Chapter 4 Kazeth Rarely in my life have I been stunned. Yet, I find myself frozen in the hallways as I stare after the stumbling girl, her feet nearly slipping as she rushes up the stairs to get away from me. When I first spotted her out of her room, I thought that maybe it would be a good time to introduce her to my nieces. If she's going to be in the house, they all need to meet at some point. But then she turned and ran straight into me. I don't understand if she was running away from the girls, or if she was just afraid to be caught out of her room. But either way... I did not help matters. I'm not trying to scare the poor thing into hiding around the house, but I've never met a creature so quiet. I can't get a single response, not even an incoherent one out of her, and all I've managed to do is drive her into a state of panic. Gritting my teeth, I inhale deeply through my nose. My magic is flaring out around me, and as I hear the door to her room slam closed, I can't control the violent pulse that emits from me. What am I supposed to do with a pest like this? I mutter to myself. Truly, I don't understand the purpose she is supposed to serve. How am I to bet a creature that just scurried around my house? I've seen the kennel master have more meaningful interactions with a litter of Urgens than I have with that girl. She couldn't even answer a simple question. Shaking my head, I decide to go after her. I can't have someone in my house that won't speak to me and wanders about. I need to at least know what she was doing. Silently, I curse myself for being such an obedient servant. I wish I could ignore the king's orders and just let her hide in her room, not worried at all about taking her. I'm not that kind of demon, though. I fulfill the tasks bestowed upon me without hesitation. And yet the thought of forcing myself upon her makes my stomach churn. I can't do that to anyone, so I guess now is as good a time as any to try and amend this relationship that has already started so badly. I linger outside her door, listening intently. I barely make out her panicked breathing, and I know that I frightened her. I don't want her to fear me, necessarily. That makes our entire arrangement much more difficult to execute. Trying to keep my annoyance in check, I knock on the door. It's soft, but loud enough for her to have heard it. Clasping my hands behind my back, I wait. My anger surges when I don't hear a voice or footsteps. Is she just going to ignore me? In my own home, no less? Without managing to reel in my flickering emotions, I raise my fist to knock on the door once more, and blue sparks fly from my fingertips as I knock harder. Again, there is no answer, and I have lost all remaining patience. This time, I pound on the door forgetting to keep the snarl out of my voice. I'm coming in! I do manage to rein in my temper to avoid disintegrating the door. I don't want to break down the girl's only semblance of privacy, and my nieces do enough damage to my home as it is. With restraint, I place my hand on the doorknob, sending a zap of magic through it that turns the mechanisms. It pops open, and I step inside. With the first sweep of my gaze, the room appears empty. The bed though slightly rumpled, is still as I left it. She's not in the chair in the corner, and the light to the attached washroom is off with the door wide open. I blink, confused. 
I even turn to peek behind the door I just opened to see if she is hiding behind it. But no, she's not there either. What in the seven? Slowing my heartbeat and my short temper with it, I take a second to assess the energy of the room, and that's when it washes over me. Her presence is here, but she's under the bed. Is she really just an animal that scurries under the nearest furniture? I can't stop a scowl from forming. My mouth twists down, and I know that my magic burns in my eyes. It's a telltale sign of my true emotions that has always given me away. I do manage to keep my voice muted, if not gentle. What are you doing down there? I tap my foot, trying not to terrify her again in hopes that she will answer. A soft scuffle alerts me to her shifting farther back from me, and I stifle a sigh. Is the bed not comfortable? The only answer I get is silence. I'm starting to wonder if she's a mute. Is she a defect and the king was unaware? Maybe we picked a bad batch, though. I know firsthand how thorough the search was. I thought this group of human females were a viable set. Not this one, I think bitterly. Taking two steps forward, she skitters opposite of me, and I growl in frustration. I brought her to a fine manner, away from those vulgar Trollvor demons. Is this bed not better than whatever accommodation she had before? At least here she has privacy and her own washroom. She was so filthy when I first saw her. I wondered if she'd seen a drop of water since the attack on Protheca. But when I saw her in the hall, it didn't look like she had taken advantage of my hospitable provisions. I rub my jaw. Is it not normal for humans to be given a washroom and a bed? Are they to be treated like beasts, to be kept in stables and hosed down by their owners? I was under the impression that she was at least sentient enough to care for herself, but that doesn't seem to be the case. No matter the reason, I won't have her in my house covered in filth. She's disgusting, and I cannot have that. If she won't take care of it herself, then I will have to do it myself. Crouching down, I peer under the bed. It's difficult to make out her shape, with the grime helping her blend into the shadows. But I can see glimpses of her. She's staring at me with wide eyes, and I try again to show her that I am not like her previous wardens. Didn't you see there's an adjoined washroom? Wouldn't you prefer to be clean? There is no indication on her face that she even understands me. And despite all my postulating, this is the first time that I genuinely wonder if she is simply a beast, a pet on Protheca. Did the king really find us a group of creatures that can't even converse with us to bed? Is this some cruel joke that I just don't get? Maybe he's trying to see who would go so far as to actually take one of them. I shake my head. None of this makes sense. I've always been more of a creature of action. And so, instead of staring at this creature who seems to understand less than a Urgen, I decide to do what I'm best at. Take action. I lurch forward and a soft yelp escapes her as she tries to flee my reach. She's pressed herself to the wall already, though, and there is nowhere else to go. I grab her forearm and it hits me, not for the first time how little she weighs as I drag her out from under the bed. No matter how she squirms, I pull her up before me, taking her in again. I've been this close to her twice now, but the dirt has made me cringe. Now I take in her matted hair and grime-covered face with an eye of scrutiny. It's going to take all the hot water in the house to scrape her skin clean, and internally, I recoil at the thought of having to do it. But if I do not, who will? She pushes at my hand, still trying to get free, and I want to snap at her. Does she not want to be clean? She'd really prefer to be dirty? Huffing, I mutter under my breath. I always have to do everything myself. First, the triplets. Then the mess of the house. And now this. All the burdens fall to me. I almost consider lifting her up, but I don't want her filthy little body pressed to mine. Instead, I drag her toward the washroom, wondering if I'm going to have to tie her up just to keep her from leaping from the bath. I don't want to do this any more than you do, I tell her, yanking her over the threshold, and the dirt that crumbles off her makes me nearly lose my grip as I recoil. What a miserable task, I think, reconsidering the king's intentions.
Chapter 5 Natalie I stand trembling in the washroom, the demon holding fast to my arm, and all I can do is curse myself as I try to pull away from him. Water is running in the bath and I'm terrified of him trying to bathe me himself. He does not seem gentle. I feel like such a fool for not answering him when he gave me the opportunity to speak up. It's the calmest I've ever seen him, and when he asked if I'd like to wash up, I should have crawled out from under the bed and told him that yes, I would like that very much. I could have taken a relaxing soak on my own, and maybe even started to feel human again. Instead, I feel like a damn animal being tossed into the scalding water. I gasp as I'm dunked under the surface, and the demon releases me long enough to roll his sleeves up. I'm still in my clothes, and before I can make any kind of protest, half drowning as the demon jostles me around, he seems to notice that the thin grey fabric is not my actual skin. He grasps my shirt, ripping it off me without strain, and he tosses the ruined top aside as he grabs a bar of soap and a brush. I shrink away from him, opening my mouth as I prepare to tell him that I am perfectly capable of cleaning myself, but he snatches my arm and jerks me forward. Water splashes my face, and I sputter as he sets about scrubbing me. My cheeks burn as he scours my shoulders and down my arms. He grabs my limbs without hesitation, wrenching them this way and that so that he can get every inch of me. When he starts on my chest, I try to get out of his hold, but there is no use. He's too strong for me, and I have to swallow my embarrassment as he scrubs my breasts without pretense. He works his way down my body, and I have to admit it does feel nice to be clean again. I almost forgot what it felt like not to itch constantly from the dirt clinging to me. I don't even protest as he pulls the flimsy shorts off my body. Even if I am still bright red, from the scalding water, I'm almost willing to submit to his handling. It's such a simple thing, and yet, this simple bath feels like such a luxury after everything I've been through. I almost sigh as he works down my thighs, but when his hand grasps my knee and goes to jerk it open, I stiffen, shooting up so that I'm in a half-crouch, partially sitting on the lip of the tub. Not there! The demon freezes, his hand still outstretched as he reaches for me. Slowly, his dark gaze lifts to mine, and his smooth brow furrows. You can talk? Surprise colours his expression, and I don't know how to respond. Did he truly think I couldn't talk? Did he not just see that I was terrified of him? I realise that's why he was cleaning me with such precision. He didn't think I could clean myself. He must have thought me little more than an animal, silent and scurrying about, and I almost feel ashamed that I led him to that conclusion. Not as much as I do that he tried to reach between my legs, but still. I swallow hard, tears burning my eyes again. I'm overwhelmed. I'm starving, embarrassed and terrified. My skin stings from how rough he's been with me, and while I'm glad that I am finally clean, I hate the manner at which I arrived here. Fighting not to let the tears fall, I finally break down and answer his question as his hands drop to the side of the tub, no longer threatening to grab me. I thought you were going to hurt me if I said anything, I say, looking away. He blinks again. It seems that he cannot process my words or reactions any more than I can his. Why would I do such a thing when I asked you a question? His jaw clenches and dark blue magic flares in his eyes. I force the next words out. I thought that's how demons are. The guards, they punished us for asking anything. I gulp. I only feared you'd treat me the same. My legs tremble as I lower my body deeper in the water. I wrap my arms around my chest, wanting to sink into the water and drown under his scrutiny. The demon's hands curl around the lip of the tub, and I see the telltale sign of sparks dancing around his fingers. He keeps his tone neutral as he speaks, giving away none of the anger that seems to be tightening his body but his words are not what I expect. I would never strike you. His tone takes on a harsher edge, and I recoil from the sparks bursting from his hands. Do you think I am such an insensitive beast, like the Trollvor? His anger strikes fear deep in me, and I pull back further. I try to form an answer, but as I stare at his darkening expression, the words die on my lips. I'm too afraid to move in his presence, much less speak, and though I know it isn't wise, I fall quiet. It only seems to make the demon angrier, and as he stares at me, my heart leaps to my throat. D 
Despite having reassured me that he won't strike me, I can't help the fear rising, and I duck my head down, protecting my face behind my arms. The stiff brush he was using clatters to the floor, the lip of the tub groans in his tight grip, and the lights above us start to flicker as his magic lashes out in heavy waves. With a harsh exhale, he whips around, storming out of the washroom, and he doesn't quite make it out before his anger unleashes in full force. The lights above me surge and falter, the sound of crackling electricity turning into a sharp buzzing until they snap out. He crosses through my bedroom as I'm left in the dark, and as the door slams closed, I realise the water around me has become frigid. He sucked the heat out of the entire room, and now I'm left in muddy and cold bathwater in the dark. My mind is at war. I'm not sure what I've done to upset him, but I'm relieved he's gone. I did feel like we were getting somewhere, but once his anger started to grow, I remembered why I had been avoiding him in the first place. He can offer me a bed and a bath, but that doesn't make him anything more than a demon. His kind stole me from my home, and we both know what is expected of me. The king has instructed him to bed me, to make use of me. Just the memory of him prying my knees apart makes the sob that has been building in my chest burst free. I press my forehead against my knees, letting the tears fall, and when I can't take it any longer, I drain the water. My tears keep flowing as I run fresh, warm water, cleaning myself this time. I scrub at my hair as the sobs escape me, and I let them. I'm too exhausted from all that I've been forced to suffer. I mourn the life I was given. Honestly, to lose it would be a relief, and having no option but to continue forward has been nothing but torment. I fear what awaits me in this home, almost more than I did under those jackal-headed demons, the Trollvor, he called them. Whatever they are, he acts as if he's better than them. But my skin burns from his handling, and even as I step out of the bathtub, finally clean and shivering as my chattering fights to overcome my tears, I can't find it in myself to see him as any different than the rest of them. I may be in a beautiful home, but it's a prison. My room is dark too, and the air is frigid. I dress quickly, finding my clothes on the floor near the threshold. Surprisingly, they're dry, and I have to assume that his bursts of magic were warm enough to zap the water from them. Once I'm dressed, I turn to look in the mirror I've been avoiding. I burst into tears all over again. I grip the wash basin as the sobs rack my frame, but I can't be bothered to calm myself. I don't recognise the person in the mirror. She looks thin, broken, forgotten. My heart breaks for her, and I wonder not, for the first time, how I'm going to get through this. Taking a breath through gritted teeth, I toss my head back and glare up at the mirror with defiance. My eyes are red, and my cheeks are blotchy. I hate how weak and pathetic I look. I wasn't always like this. I used to be someone. Toklas once told me I was the light of his world. What have I become? And even more, what is to become of me? Chapter 6 Kazeth So she can talk, and she's not a complete idiot after all. It's easy enough to let my fury overtake me and storm out of the washroom, but when the bedroom door shuts behind me, I give pause. Kazeth, I reprimand myself silently. You're acting a beast. The girl is frightened out of her wits. Who wouldn't be? The fact that she survived the troll vor should be commended in and of itself. They are brutes of the highest order, only fit to serve beneath the king. We don't even allow them to breed with matrons, not that one would ever accept them into their bedchambers. By the unwritten rules of our society, they are anomalies. Most are neutered at birth, only suited to guard with their brute strength and small brains. My magic, unbound, finally settles as I listen for her gentle sobs. But she is silent. I'm beginning to realize that it must be a survival instinct, learned from her brief stay in the royal dungeons. Or maybe even further from her life on Prathika as a slave to the Dark Elves. I have heard tales of the horrific conditions they kept the humans in, and had imagined our presence to be a welcome relief. But maybe I am mistaken. Those damn troll for, I curse internally. They would eat their own spawn if they could produce them. And now they have ruined my gift from King Asmodeus. She does not trust us. She does not trust me in particular. 
and I have given her little reason to do so. Fine rooms. Be damned. I let out a long sigh and lean against the doorframe, using the chaos magic imbued in all things to hear better into her room. The soft pad of bare feet becomes audible to me. The shift of cloth and a slight sniffle. I was in such a rush to see her cleaned up. I didn't have a chance to appreciate her rich flesh and dark hair once she was. And now that I know she is sentient, it pains me to realize I treated her like an animal. Still, she is weak. How can the king presume to breed an army from such beings? I can't even be sure we're compatible, she and I. My jaw works furiously as I consider what to do next. I can't leave things the way they are between us. Resentment grows far faster than trust, and I have fumbled both. Damn it, I say aloud, racking my mind for an easy resolution, of which there is none. I simply have to apologize and hope that I receive the more generous end of her forgiveness. Then a thought strikes me like a blow to my gut. She has not eaten since she arrived and was likely neglected by her jailers before that. It is my duty to keep her fed long enough to breed with, and though the latter sends a shiver of disgust through me, the former is manageable. More than manageable, it is a precedent. But I must wait until she is presentable, or she may take my sudden reappearance as another intrusion. I listen again, harder this time, so that I can almost see her movements behind my eyes. The sweep of cloth against flesh tells me that she is dressed again, and on an even stroke she brushes her matted hair until the tangles are worked out. It is another beat of my heart before I knock, stilling her movements. Human, I say a little too harshly, resolved to soften my tone on a steadying breath. May I come in? There is only silence, but she does not throw her chair back or scurry under the bed again, so I grip the knob, carefully this time, easing the door open as if it were to my own quarters. She sits across from me at the petite vanity that had once served as Valindra's when she was younger, simply staring at me with those wide, sad eyes. Any sudden movement will no doubt set her tense form into action. Whether or not she is sentient, she has the instincts of a wild binmo. Her hair is still wet from the bath, and I have the rare instinct to finish drying her off. But she is no child. She is considered a woman among her own kind, and ours, apparently. There is no need to run, I tell her measuring up her diminutive form. There were taller ones. I could have chosen any number of them, but at the time she seemed... easy to handle. She says nothing in return, her thin arms taut as if she intends to rise. I mean you no harm, I say. The woman's throat leaps as she swallows. I wish to apologize for my actions until now. I did not know until very recently that you could speak the common tongue since you had not answered my questions. Nothing changes about her except her gaze, which flits to my crown of horns briefly, before alighting upon the thin line of my mouth. She opens her own as if to say something, then snaps it shut again in reconsideration. Magic burns beneath my skin. Teach her a lesson, comes a most intrusive thought. You are the master of the house. Demand her respect. And if I do... That resentment in her expression will flourish. No, I cannot betray her again. She has had such a dismal introduction to my kind that I will only verify her assumptions. The longer I observe her, the more I notice that she is not quite the pest I'd made her out to be. The bath has done wonders for her skin, which nearly glows in the soft light of the room. Her round cheeks are flushed, and her heart rate increases as my eyes begin to wander so I keep them raised. I'm sorry for your handling. If you'll allow me, I'll do my best to make it up to you. Her body relaxes, but only slightly. When she finally speaks, it's that high voice I remember from the bath, like a bird from Prothica that has gotten lost and found its way up here. It's a melancholy sound, and even as she works to soften it, I can hear an edge of defiance that doesn't quite belong to her, almost as if she's trying to mimic someone else someone with far more courage than she. And how are you going to do that? She asks before closing her eyes almost fearfully. My magic flares of its own volition. 
I suppress it without moving a muscle. Firstly, I have provided a wardrobe, a bedroom, and a bath, which you have already become acquainted with. Secondly, I hesitate, wondering if her resentment doesn't partially stem from the fact that I've neglected her basic needs. It has been a day, and I have not sent the Zonak to deliver her food. I have prepared something for you downstairs, if you will join me. Her distrust is evident when she doesn't budge. Does she think I mean to eat her? Or did she understand all that the king spoke of in her presence? I never considered that she may be privy to her fate as a breeder. Heat crawls up my spine at the thought. No wonder she shrank from my touch. She thinks I mean to ravage her here and now when it is the furthest thing from my mind. It is food, I emphasize. Are you hungry? Her eyes widen again, but it is not the fearful expression I've grown used to. Rather, it is a look of surprise and relief, one that brightens her soft features so they're almost beautiful. Not at all like the sharp features of a matron, but somehow still endearing. Seeing her light up sends a different sort of shiver through me, one that makes all my little hair stand on end. My magic races across my flesh, igniting a feeling I've long since surrendered for the greater good. It's a pleasure that runs deep. It makes my mouth go dry so that I have to run my tongue over my sharp canines. I don't know how often humans need to eat, but you must be hungry after your time in the castle. She takes a cautious breath, her gaze flitting to the open door behind me. I think she means to make another run for it when she finally speaks. Will there be others? My lips curl up at the edges. No. Not if you don't want. The human lets out a shuddering exhale. I can taste her fear and apprehension, even from here. But when she rises from her seat at the vanity, it sends a trill of excitement through me. Instead of backing away, she stands her ground, though it seems to take a considerable effort for her to remain in my shadow. Her threadbare clothes do her slate frame little justice, and I wonder why she hasn't raided the closet yet. My nieces would have done so in a heartbeat. But I'm starting to understand that I shouldn't presume with this one. When I do, it never turns out the way I expect. Slowly, so she doesn't bolt, I put out my hand to her. Will you join me? Chapter 7 Natalie. He's waiting for an answer, hand outstretched. There's something gentle in his expression, despite the marks over his sharp eyes and cheekbones that occasionally flare with magic. Can I trust him at his word? He is not like the Trollvor demons, that snarl and jeer without an ounce of remorse. But if he is intelligent enough to deceive me, then he could be just like the Dark Elves. Still, I have to take the leap, or I may never eat again. I find my voice again, meek and unsteady as I repeat. Food? A small smile finds him. Yes, I want to believe him. His is the first kindness I've experienced since arriving here, aside from Cora and the other women. I observe his proffered hand, with long slender claws cutting out from where nails ought to be. All he has to do is reach out, and... He retracts his hand, and his face becomes unreadable again. If you'd rather not... No! I shout, only realising I've done so once the room goes deadly quiet. I... I mean, yes, I'll join you. If it isn't proof enough, a growl rips through my gut that makes him cock an eyebrow at me. I throw my gaze to the floor as if I've broken a rule. And maybe I have. He told me not to make any unnecessary noise. But when I dare to glance up at him again, humour sparks in his void, dark eyes, and his chuckle is low. This way, is all he says, leading me from the security of my new room. I clamp my mouth shut and follow after, listening hard for any sounds of the demon girls that flooded the lower level with their ramblings. But all is quiet as we descend the fine staircase, made of what looks like obsidian. Everything in his home is elegant in its own way. The king's castle was cold and rigid, along with its owner. This place, it's not like anything I've ever seen, resembling nothing of the Dark Elves' architecture, intricate for the sake of intricacy. Yet it's far more ornate than the shacks and hovels the Dark Elves submitted us to in the work camps. I don't know if I could ever get used to it. 
the way it opens up into a wide living space with finely carved furniture in slight disarray, as if the female demons had made a quick escape when I wasn't looking. I feel fortunate that it's only him and I in this moment. He's more than enough demon for me. When the heat of his focus turns on me again, I pause in my descent. There's a hardness to his refined jawline that wasn't there before, as if he's measuring me up. And I can never quite tell if he's looking at me or through me. They're gone for the time being, he says, as if he was already aware of my concerns. You can meet them later, at your own pace. I don't dare speak my mind, but the questions pile up. Who are they to him? Are they his daughters or lovers? They seem too young to be full-fledged demons, but I know scant little about his kind that is not mired in terror. And if I ask the wrong questions, I fear I'll garner more than just his ire. I can't forget how the demon king charged him with bedding me, like I'm some captive bride for his pleasure. There is nothing stopping him from taking me, and yet he wants to feed me instead. To make me strong, I think with sudden dread, so that I can bear his demonic spawn. My heart leaps into my throat at the notion. There's no use forgetting the role I'm meant to play here. Toklas didn't love me for what my body could offer him. He wanted me, just as I wanted him. No matter how his world was slanted in his favour, he never did use it against me. But this demon has no such reservations. By the cut of his lean shoulders, I can tell he holds himself to a higher standard than the others of his kind. The king held him in high regard as well, enough to fulfil the task laid out for him without question. Tears sting my eyes, and I bat them away just as he leads me into a grand dining hall with a long table built to seat at least a dozen demons, its top at the level of my chest. Above it is an impressive chandelier that's already glowing softly with unearthly flames. The table, however, is empty. He seems to realise that I'm lingering and returns to my side, pressing an insistent hand to my low back and leading me to the table. Sit, he says as he draws a chair out for me. I do need a moment to prepare. I'm confused. Didn't he say there was food? A rolling grumble escapes my belly again, and I try to stifle it with a swallow, scrambling into the seat he's offered. When he seems content that I'm not going to run away, he takes one long stride backward, putting his palms up. Magic dances around his fingertips, and when he waves, it leaps from his hands, sending a shower of blue sparks over the table's surface. The fragrant smells hit me first, and a gasp escapes me. Before my very eyes, a feast appears, the table overflowing with good things to eat. I thought I would have to grow accustomed to the demon's diet, but among the new and strange are familiar dishes too some that I could have prepared myself. I can only describe the banquet as abundance, morsels and fruits abound, many from Protheca and others I've never seen before, rolls and rye and salami hailing from Oshta, rare cheeses from the west and Torah steaks from the north. I know these things because Toklas had once shared his rations with me and said they're much more besides. And pastries, pastries galore, I can't imagine where to start, my mouth watering something fierce. The demon sits at the head of the table, never once picking up a utensil. His plate remains empty as he takes me in with more interest than before. I assume he is wondering if I ever plan on eating the bounty he's provided. Embarrassment burns my cheeks, and I take a generous helping of the nearest dish, which is a silver salad that appears more metal than leaf. Thank you, I say, not sure what else he expects from me. How did you do that? His eyes remain fixed on me, and his lips pressed shut. There's something not entirely friendly about how he's looking at me, but he has offered this meal, and I don't intend on spurning him. So I spear a few leaves and take the smallest nibble at first, finding it more succulent than it appears. I can't help but take a true bite. There are red spuds drizzled in a dark gravy. I take a sample of everything within reach, from the tora to the gallus, and everything in between. My fingers are sticky after trying the strange golden fruits that ooze with sweet nectar, and I lick them clean, throwing a glance over to my host, my captor, before giving pause. He's still staring. I swallow down my bite, wondering if I've offended him again. This demon is impossible to read. His moods are fickle, so that one moment it's difficult to breathe, the very air charged by his magics. The next, he is cool and calculating, measuring me with the heavy stare of his impossibly dark gaze. I think he means to devour me instead. Using the napkin provided, I rub the nectar off my fingertips. I'm sorry, I... 
Before I realise he's moved, he's already seized my jaw. My apology withers as he leans in, his unyielding gaze scouring every inch of my countenance. I don't know that I can speak. His grip is so tight, but I don't dare either. He's a predator of the highest order. I have dealt with predators before, but not like him. A creature without an ounce of humanity, his alien features so like the elves, and yet there is no mistaking them as he dips his horned crown closer. Even sitting, he towers over me. His silvery hair falls over one shoulder as he leans in and draws a slow breath through his shapely nose. I swear our lips nearly brush. My heartbeat thunders in my ears, and I'm certain he can hear it too. His eyes narrow as mine widen, refusing to blink lest he moves too quickly again. If I keep him in my sights. A scowl comes over him as if he's found me not to his liking, then releases me all at once, his gaze flitting away, freeing me from my paralysis. If you're finished, he says with a dismissive wave, you may return to your room. I waver in my seat, just like that? There is still so much food left to be eaten, but suddenly, I'm not hungry any longer. A queasiness settles into my gut with the steak, and I shove myself back from the table without a word. Fury settles under my skin as I storm away on trembling legs, afraid of what I might say if I give myself the opportunity. He's a demon, I remind myself, my sight blurring with the onset of fresh tears. I'd be a fool to expect anything else from him. Chapter 8 Kazeth The human's receding footsteps echo off the halls as I'm left alone in the dining room with nothing but my thoughts. I rub my thumb and forefinger together absent-mindedly, the feeling of her smooth, soft flesh lingering on the pads of my fingers. That skin, beneath all of the dirt, tears, and grime, she has the most gorgeous olive skin, as if she were made to bask in the sun. The golden tones of her flesh only accent her large, warm brown eyes, which are made even more stunning by the thick fringe of lashes that frame them. My mind wanders back to the way she looked at me when I held her chin, the way her full lips parted slightly as she tilted her head back. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought she wanted me to kiss her. I almost did. My eyes dart back toward the archway where she disappeared, as if by thinking about her, I'd suddenly summon her back to the table. I shake my head, glancing at the empty plate in front of me. I've lost all appetite for food, although my appetite in other areas is becoming harder to control. I shake my head again, trying to clear my mind of all of these thoughts. The human is intended to be a broodmare. I can't let these silly sentimentalities interfere with my duty. I'm to reproduce with the human for the good of the demon race, nothing more. Despite my best efforts, I keep returning to how beautiful the girl is as I pace about the house, trying to keep myself busy. The prince may be able to defy King Asmodeus's orders and survive, but I have no such royal standing to defend me if I were to shirk my duties. Even as one of the most powerful Sosgaroth demons on the planet, I am still only a servant. And as a servant, if I were to fall short of the king's expectations, even if only through hesitation, I'll be tossed off of Galmaleth in short order. I need to bed the human before the end of the day, if not for my sake, then for the girls. They already lost their mother. If I were to go against the king, I'd be costing them the only home and caretaker they've ever known. The thought sends a shudder through me and only strengthens my resolve to do what needs to be done. Female demons are coveted for many reasons, but their ability to maintain the race tops the list of reasons they are so heavily protected. What may happen to them if I'm gone and they're forced into their duties too early? I grind my teeth refusing to let myself go any further in this train of thought. That will not happen, because I won't give the king any reason to doubt me or my loyalty. I will do what needs to be done, all sentimentality aside, if only to protect my girls. Chatter fills the front of the house, echoing back to the main hall where I'm seated in my armchair, brooding in front of the fireplace. A small smile tugs at my lips as the sounds of the triplets gabbing away about their friends and their studies makes the estate come alive again. I'm going to be the first one to gain the favor of the royal family. I just know it. 
I'll probably even catch the eye of a prince, and then you'll all have to listen to me. Oh, please, no prince is going to choose you. Besides, everybody knows you have a crush on Orthrian, and he's just a normal Volvath. Alincia gasps, and Tanulia giggles from behind her. The girls finally turn the corner into the room, and before I can even greet them, Alincia whirls on me, her yellow eyes dancing with all the fury of Hellfire. Kazeth! Valindra is being mean to me! Tell them I'm going to be with a prince and that they have to obey me because I'm going to be favored by the royal family. I groan as Valindra rolls her eyes over Alincia's shoulder. I'm not being mean, Valindra protests before I can respond, her violet eyes finding mine. She's not going to be with a prince and besides, she's just a baby. I'm going to mature first anyhow. I am not a baby, Alincia shrieks at Valindra. You were only born eight minutes before me and you're not the boss of me. I find my voice just as Alincia and Valindra are about to fly at one another. Girls, I roar over them, jumping to my feet in case I need to pry Alincia and Valindra apart. My magic crackles around me, my aura sparking a deep blue in warning. Thankfully, the sound of my voice stops all three of the girls in their tracks, Valindra freezing where she is, Alincia turning to face me, and Tanulia trying her best to disappear into the background. I huff, rubbing my face in frustration before sinking back down into my chair. Valindra, don't antagonize your sister. Valencia, Valindra may not be the boss of you, but you're not the boss of anyone else either, I say firmly, looking at each of them as I address them. Besides, you're all far too young to be worrying about mating, I continue, giving them each a pointed look. That's still several years off, and you shouldn't be pairing for status regardless. You may find someone you love, and their status will not matter. All three of the girls have the decency to look thoroughly chastised before Valindra walks over to stand beside me, crossing her arms. What's wrong? she asks. I glance up at her, not bothering to hide the confusion and exasperation on my face. What do you mean, what's wrong? I mean, you hardly ever yell at us, especially not over stupid squabbles. So, something must be wrong. Valindra says, explaining in her usual matter-of-fact way. Both Alincia and Tanulia drift back toward where we stand, looking far too interested in our conversation for my liking. What's wrong is that the three of you have been using me as your personal Zonak, I grumble back at her, turning back toward the roaring fire in the hearth. Valindra is eyeing me as if she doesn't believe me, but I press ahead, taking the opportunity to air out my frustrations. All of you are old enough to clean up after yourselves. Do you know what kind of state this room was in when I got home today? I'm tired of being walked all over in my own home. You're all perfectly capable of picking up. We have the Zonak for that. What are you really upset about? She says, propping her hands on her hips and leveling me with a look that reminds me so much of Dranatha that my chest tightens with pain. Nothing the three of you need to be concerned about, I say dismissively realizing my error a moment too late. So there is something wrong? Tanulia asks, coming to sit at the foot of my chair, her dark eyes wide with worry as she gazes up at me. I run my hand over her flaxen blonde hair, smoothing it over her budding horns. No, darling, nothing is wrong, I murmur, hoping to quell her anxiety. Well, it must be something if you're so grumpy, Alencia quips, sitting on the arm of my chair. I groan, unable to contain my ire as I shoot her a look for scaring her sister. The three of you need to go to your rooms. I'm not interested in another sparring match today, I growl, letting my aura turn dark and pulsing around me. I suck the heat from the room, setting the fire flickering, hoping that my magical display will get them to clear out and quit bugging me. No such luck. If you tell us why you're grouchy, I promise we'll go to our rooms. We'll even pick up after we're done playing. Alincia says sweetly, a slight whine in her voice as she bats her lashes at me. We both know that's a lie, but with three sets of demonic adolescent girls' eyes on me, I finally yield under the pressure. We have a new guest. The words are hardly out of my mouth when the girls begin squealing, jumping up and down excitedly and talking over one another. A guest? Who is it? Is it a woman? We could really use someone more fun to play with. Why is she staying with us? Is it because you like her? 
Is she on the council? Where is she? Can we see her? I sigh again, already regretting having opened my mouth. I can stand before the king, coordinate raids on the surface of Protheca, snap necks without so much as lifting a finger, and yet these three teenage girls can drag information out of me in the span of a heartbeat. Yes, our guest is a woman. No, she is not on the council, and no, you cannot see her, I say on a sigh, rattling off answers to the questions they hurled at me. She's a human, and very frightened. I doubt the three of you would put her at ease, I tell them, giving them each a pointed look. A human, Valencia says, a hand flying to her chest, the picture of an aghast socialite. I've never seen a human before. Please, can we see her? Tanulia begs, grabbing my pant leg. What if we promise to be on our best behavior? Valindra bargains. No, I say sternly, adding an air of finality to the word. The three of you are not to disturb her. And stay out of the West Wing, I add as an afterthought. Big mistake. The girls exchange a meaningful look, and then sprint from the room, squealing and giggling up the stairs down the hall. Girls! I yell after them, leaping to my feet as I run after them up the stairs, taking them two at a time. The triplets have too large of a head start, however, and are already turning down the west wing by the time I reach the top of the stairs. God's damn it all! I grumble, chasing after them. Chapter 9 Natalie I'm still moping in my room over the strange turn of events in the dining hall, when the distant sounds of squealing seep into my room. I freeze next to the window, my head whipping towards the door as the sounds of laughter get nearer. The floor rumbles with the pounding of several pairs of footsteps, and my eyes dart desperately around the room, looking for a place to hide. Before I can think better of it, I dive into the bed, halfway under the covers, when the door to my room bursts open a clamour of voices following after it. Three figures dart toward me, and it's an effort not to scream when they leap right into my bed. I recognise them from earlier in the day, when they were eating and talking in the dining hall, before the demon who claimed me caught me snooping. All three of the demon girls have the same flaxen white blonde hair and ashen grey skin, and all look to be about the same age, although that's where their similarities end. Each of the girls has a different set of horns, all seeming to be at about the same stage of growth. One of the girls, with bright violet eyes, has a ring of budding horns like a crown atop her head, similar to the demon man. The demon girl with fiery yellow eyes only has two smooth horns budding from the top of her head and eyes me sceptically, her face a touch too close to mine for comfort. The third, quietest girl looks at me with wonder, stroking my hair softly her head angled in a way that lets the light reflect off of her black eyes and the two antler-like stubs protruding from her skull. Her eyes are so big and so pretty, remarks the violet-eyed girl. And her hair is so soft, murmurs the dark-eyed one, continuing to stroke my hair in long motions as if she were petting a dog. The yellow-eyed one wrinkles her nose as her gaze falls to my clothing and asks, Are all humans this dirty? Why hasn't she gotten new clothes? I would have half a mind to be embarrassed if I weren't so scared out of my wits. Before I can think of anything to say or do, the girls berate me with questions, their voices lapping over one another before I can find the space to respond. What's your name? How did you get your hair to be so shiny? Mine is never that shiny. Where is your house? Why are you staying with us? Do you belong to Kazeth? Do you want to play with us? Can I brush your hair, please? Why does your skin look so brown? Are all humans brown? Do you have any friends? Are they coming to stay with us? Are all humans this quiet? Can you talk? At this point, I'd gladly take the scary, stony-faced demon over the three girls. I try to control my breathing, fighting the urge to clamp my hands down over my ears. The demon girls are all smiling, fawning over my hair, skin, eyes, anything they can see. But I still can't help but feel terrified. They're all so loud and although they're acting like children, they're all so much bigger than I am. A part of me is somewhat offended that I'm being treated like a new, shiny pet, but another, larger part of me is flattered that they're so excited by my mere presence. In all my life, I've never been greeted with such enthusiasm, and it makes my heart warm to them, 
even if I can feel my hands trembling under the covers with fear. It occurs to me as they chatter away and poke at me that these three girls may be the demon's daughters, and the thought sends a whole new wave of emotions through me. If these girls are his daughters, then he clearly must have a partner. Or do demons believe in concepts like love? Some strange part of me hopes that he does believe in love and marriage and other romantic concepts, but why this would matter to me I'm not sure. But if he believes in love, then there's someone he chose to have three daughters with. Something like jealousy races through me, before my fingers twine tightly in the sheets. If he's in love, or even if he just has a partner who is bearing him children, then why in the gods' names am I here? Surely the woman of the house won't be thrilled that her husband is bedding a human. Ice-cold terror creeps through my veins as I consider the idea that I may have an enraged demon woman coming to murder me for sleeping with her husband. I've almost worked up the courage to ask the girls where their mother is, and if I should be sleeping with one eye open when a massive, horned shadow appears in the doorway. Stop! His voice is like frost, his already intimidating features hard with fury. If I wasn't sitting down, I might have fainted from the terror of seeing him so angry. The three girls freeze where they are, heads turning toward the doorway so fast, it's a wonder they don't snap their necks. A silly voice inside me wants to protect the three girls, to tell him to go away, but I have no doubt they're more than capable of defending themselves if they've been sharing a house with the demon for this long. I open my mouth to apologise, to beg for mercy, when I realise he's glaring at the three demon girls, not me. I told the three of you, he growls, his voice hardly above a whisper, to stay out of the West Wing and not to bother our new guest. A deep, black-blue aura pulses around him, crackling with energy like a roaring fire. Guest, I think to myself, trying to rein in my surprise at being referred to with that kind of respect. If he didn't look like he was about to combust with raw, magical power, I might thank him for reining in the three demon sisters before all of the excitement well and truly overstimulates me. The girls slink off the bed, their eyes downcast as they all fiddle with their shirts or fold their hands behind their backs. In case I was not clear enough before, he continues, his voice harder than granite. You are not to bother her. Do not barge into her rooms. Do not berate her with questions and absolutely do not touch her. Their eyes still glued to the floor, the three girls nod and murmur their agreement. Go to your rooms, all of you. I will call you downstairs when I'm ready to discuss this further. Without so much as a backward glance, the three girls file out of the room, and only when they're in the hallway do I hear hushed whispers. Now! He shouts over his shoulder, skittering steps echoing in response. Left alone with only the angry demon, I pull the covers over my head, fruitlessly hoping that they'll somehow shield me from his wrath. The door shuts quietly, and we're left in suffocating silence. With anyone else, I would have assumed they'd left the room once I heard the door shut, but it's like I can feel his presence, his eyes boring into where I'm lying on the bed, and when he speaks, I'm not surprised. I'm sorry for the girls. I had told them explicitly not to bother or disturb you, but as you can see, they don't listen very well, he says, his tone genuinely apologetic. I don't respond. Not sure what I'm supposed to say to the demon loitering near the end of my bed. My heart is still pounding in my chest, and a heavy tremor grips me. Their behaviour, well, their children, I suppose. I've never really known what to do with them. He sounds so tired all of a sudden that I have to fight the urge to peer over the top of the blankets. I suppose it's easier for him, to be honest, to show some vulnerability if he can pretend I'm not listening. I'm all too aware of him as the end of the bed dips beneath his staggering weight. The demon sits on the edge of the mattress with a sigh. I can't tell if he's exasperated that I haven't come out of hiding, or that the girls clearly have minds of their own. Perhaps both. Silence settles between us once again, and in comparison to the ruckus, it's almost... comfortable. I keep my breathing as even and quiet as possible, trying not to think too hard about the fact that we're both in bed, regardless of the fact that we have a mound of blankets and a solid foot of space between us. I feel his weight shift, a surprisingly human mannerism, almost as if he's trying to decide whether he should leave the room or not. He must decide against leaving, because I feel him turn his body toward me to look at where I'm buried beneath the plush quilt and silken sheets. You do know why you're here, don't you? He asks, 
his voice quiet and grave. My blood runs cold. Is he going to demand that we fulfill our obligations right here, right now? My palms turn slick with sweat and I nod, not sure I could summon my voice if I wanted to. I realize that he might not be able to see me beneath the covers, so I poke my head out, repeating the gesture. Despite having the chance to observe the demon several times now, I still find his presence unnerving. His head is cocked slightly, as if he were a predator sniffing out his prey, his pitch black eyes gleaming in the dying light streaming in from the windows. He nods, repeating my gesture, and holds my gaze. Good. Chapter 10 Kazeth Long ago, when I was a student of Plethel, a Sazgaroth master, he brought to us a Dazaneth, freshly trained. Despite its finger-length, razor-sharp teeth and claws, it whimpered in the corner, eyes averted, muscles coiled as though expecting a blow. The sight had made me sick. I'm reminded of the beast, beaten by magic into terrified submission, whenever I look at the human. They have the same eyes, or rather, the same cautious way of looking through them. Downcast, but ever alert. She lies on her side now, the blanket pulled up to her nose. It should be a relaxing pose, but she looks ready to flee even now. Does she ever stop waiting for the switch to fall? Has her life made her like this, or have demons treated her so poorly? The thought of anyone striking her sticks in my chest, hot and thick. Lights flicker overhead, and her eyes widen. She's so still with her fear, so silent, that it's easy to misread her as calm. I see that now. She isn't simple or docile at all. Her blank expression masks an abject terror I can't even imagine, one I've only seen on prey just before the inevitable kill. You are afraid. I smooth my expression as best I can, but I don't suppose it's much help. I must look like something out of a nightmare for her, with my horns and teeth and markings of chaos magic writ boldly across my face. You need not be. Slowly, cautiously, she peels the blanket back. It's more to appease me than anything else, I think, but I'm grateful for the gesture. She keeps her gaze pointed at my feet, and she twists the blanket until her knuckles pale but eventually the blanket falls, revealing a beautiful woman. A beautiful woman in rags. The triplets had said something to that effect, but they're prone to exaggeration. Alincia in particular is convinced that any fashion more than a season old is as desirable as Urgendong to wear, and she makes no bones about berating me for her suffering. But this is truly unacceptable. I will bring you proper clothing. My frustration with myself bleeds into my voice, and she shrinks away. The fault is entirely mine. The girls, she says, voice rough with disuse. I have to lean forward in order to hear what she's saying at all. I find that I enjoy the sound of her voice, smooth and soft. It's like an arrow in the wind. Are they your daughters? Daughters! I would lose what little of my mind remains. I can't stop the laugh that booms from my chest at the mere thought of it. Gods, they've nearly driven me mad enough. They chatter so much that the echo of it follows me everywhere, ringing in my ears even as I go about my official duties. I haven't had a moment of silence in my own home since they were born, and it seems as though I never will again, unless I'm lucky enough to pawn them off to the council. And that brings only more problems. What if the girls decide to pair early or with someone unsuitable? I've already had to chase away more than one suitor, and the girls are more stubborn than a binmo. The human woman flinches at my unruly laughter, and I shut my mouth like a trap to silence it. She's so easily startled, and I don't want her to flee beneath the bedsheets again. It's been so long since I laughed like this that I'd forgotten just how loud I could be. Finally, I answer her. They're not mine. I try to keep my voice as soft as hers, but it's difficult. I'm used to shouting out spells and orders. I've never had to silence myself for anyone's comfort before, 
save the king himself. They're my sisters, I continue. She met her purpose many years ago. The woman tilts her head, unfamiliar with the euphemism I use for the triplet's benefit, who are all likely standing with their ears pressed to the door. For a moment I consider sending a light spark to chase them away, but I decide not to punish them for honest curiosity. It could frighten the human. I lower my voice as much as it can go. My sister died a long time ago. Except it wasn't so long, not for a demon like myself. It seems only a few moons ago she was here, cajoling me to conjure up her favorite snacks as she grew the triplets in her burgeoning womb. I had been so fearful for her, and she was so disdainful. And how many times have I feared for your safety? She demanded with arms crossed above her swollen stomach. While you attend to the king. I didn't answer her, but my lips pressed together so tightly they drew blood. Triplets are rare. Surviving the birth of triplets doubly so. We'd both known she might not survive. And so when the father lost his life in the arena, she'd come to live with me in my estate, and we'd set up the nursery in my home. She'd given me their names ahead of time and trained me in infant care because she'd told me that Zagfurs couldn't be trusted with the precious lives of newborn demons. To my surprise, I find I'm telling the human all of this. They never slept at the same time. I sigh. And so I did what I must, and fashioned a pallet of blankets beside their cribs as though I were at war. Valindra, in particular, was a beast as an infant. We couldn't keep a wet nurse because she'd go for blood every time. Oh, the human responds. It happens sometimes without the mother, I explain. The children do not have the maternal bond that shields their teeth. In any case, it's a good omen among demons to feed so strongly. Of course, it meant that I had to use other methods. What an exhausting experience that had been, trying to conjure a proper nipple the triplets wouldn't destroy with their fangs. If they had tolerated the wet nurse, I might have had a few moments to myself. Instead, their infancy passed as a whirlwind of exhaustion and grief. I was no substitute for their mother, but I did my best, which, as you can see by their abhorrent behavior, was entirely inadequate. I heave a disappointed breath, but I can't help the way my lips tug up in the corners. They're spirited just like she was. I was there for their first steps, their first flight, and their first sparks of magic. All of them are trouble, mind you but I see her in them every day. I'd like to think she'd find my parenting adequate. The human sniffles, and I stifle my surprise. Humans are weak and prone to sickness. Have I failed in my care for her so much that she's grown ill? She glances up at me from beneath her long lashes, and I understand. She's crying again. Tears spill down her cheeks freely. I'm honestly baffled. What have I done now? I've kept my voice quiet and fangs hidden the entire time. Is something wrong? It must have been so hard for you to lose your sister. She wipes her eyes with her grimy sleeve, and I suppress a wince. I need to find her new clothing immediately. And for her to miss raising her own children, she continues with a sob. I can't even imagine how the girls feel having lost their mother. You cry over a stranger. I say, puzzled. The concept is absurd, but I find myself strangely touched by her care. You don't even know her name. You could tell me. Dranatha. Her name rolls off my tongue easily, as though I've just called her down for dinner. How long has it been since I've said it out loud? And her daughters are Valindra, Tanulia, and Alincia. She named them? She did. The human meets my eyes now timidly, and I find myself holding my breath as she studies me with her glassy brown eyes. Whatever she finds in my face must put her at ease, because she finally releases the tension in her shoulders and sets her open hands at her sides. I am Natalie. Natalie. I like how her name tastes. Who named you Natalie? My mother, I suppose. Did you know her well? Natalie pauses and then shakes her head. I lived in a work camp. It's all I've ever known. I don't know if my parents died or if they were just desperate enough to sell me. Cora, one of the women in the camps, was sort of everyone's mother there. Until... 
A rare flash of anger twists her expression, and I find myself helplessly intrigued. Perhaps Natalie isn't as meek as she seems. I am called Kazeth, I say. I don't believe we have been properly introduced. It was kind of you to take in your nieces, she says. Three infants at once must have been difficult. It would have been harder to give them up. The mere thought of Natalie's parents choosing to sell her makes my fingertips crackle with retaliatory fury. If they were here, I would melt the flesh from their skulls. I keep that to myself, however, because Natalie's chin has begun to quiver again, and a fresh torrent of tears flow. I have summoned magic of unmeasurable power and bent the depths of chaos to my will. It is said by many that my name will be written in the Book of Sazgaroth when my purpose comes to find me. I have raised children and manifested an army of stone. There is nothing on Galmaleth I cannot accomplish, and I suspect the same of the world below. But gods help me. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with this crying woman. Thank you for enjoying this production. Go ahead and click that subscribe button. Also, did you know we have a shop? Check the link in the description for deals on bundles. Chapter 11. Natalie. Dranatha. The name of the demon woman I've never known, Karzeth's sister, rebounds in my head as we stare at each other. Prior to today, I only viewed Karzeth as my nameless, terrifying captor, capable of wielding destructive magic, completely without compassion or emotion, and hell-bent on breeding me. Looking at him now, my heart aches for him. I had been terrified of him, and it was easy for me to think of him as some monster whose only purpose was to use and terrify me, but I'm slowly beginning to realise that he's not a bad demon, just someone in a tough situation. The irony of going from being terrified of Kazeth to viewing him as something close to a companion is not lost on me, and my tears come faster. I'd been terrified of Toklis too, before falling in love with him. Kazeth's loss hits too close to home. Both of us lost people we loved, and both of us carry that burden with us every waking moment of our lives. My throat closes around a sob, and try as I might to stifle it, a small, pained noise slips from between my lips. In an instant, Karzeth is beside me, wrapping his thick arms around me. I'm too lost in my grief to be scared of his proximity. I finally lose control of my tears, and sobs rack my body as he presses me tightly to his chest. Tears chase down my cheeks and I press my face further into him, my tears coming faster. Kazeth's hand trails gently up my back, before settling on the back of my head, stroking my hair as I cry. A part of me is shocked by his tenderness and willingness to comfort me in this moment, especially after all that's happened before now. But his touch anchors me. We weather the storm together, and by the time my sobs subside, I realise he's rocking me gently, whispering sweet little nothings in my ear. I sniffle, pulling away slightly to look up at him. His black eyes gleam back down at me, and I think I catch a hint of sorrow in his expression. The silence between us is almost too much to bear, and I feel the need to justify my reaction. I lost somebody too. Not my sister, but someone I love. Do you want to talk about it? His voice is soft and deep, something about it reminding me of Velvet. I blink at him, surprised that he cares enough to ask. I swipe away stray tears, trying to disguise my miserable countenance. His name was Toklis, I managed to whisper, my voice cracking as I say his name. I haven't spoken it since the day he died, and it feels strange on my tongue. I shake my head, pushing myself to continue. If Kazeth can share such a dark, intimate experience from his past, it's only fair that I do the same. He was a dark elf who was stationed at the work camp I was in before, before I came here. He didn't have much social standing and even less magic, so he did the work no other dark elf wanted to do. When he first arrived at the camp, I avoided him. We could never tell if they were going to hurt us or try to lure us into their bed, so we all just steered clear of them. They rarely gave us enough to eat, and one day, one of the children was so hungry that we couldn't get him to stop crying. If any of us... Even the children cried too much or took too long to do our work. They'd beat us. I knew the kitchens were empty, so I snuck around to the storage building that they always kept locked. I just thought if I could get him something to eat, even something small, it'd help. 
I trail off, glancing at Karzeth. His black eyes are ablaze with an emotion I can't quite read, and his lips are a thin line of disapproval, but not for me. I glance away again, trying not to lose my nerve. Toklis found me when I was sneaking back out of the kitchen with a loaf of bread. I was sure he was going to lash me for it, or turn me in to the other guards. But when I explained what was happening, he disappeared back into the storage building and came out with bags of dried meats and fruits. He escorted me all the way to my hut and helped me hand out the extra rations. After that, well, it was easy for me to fall for him, and he felt the same. We had to keep it a secret, of course, but we were going to run away together. We were going to be happy. I take a deep, shuddering breath before pressing on. He was there when your people came. I sneak another look at Kazeth's face, cold and impassive as granite. He saw that they were taking human women and he tried to hide me, protect me. He made me crawl under his bed and promise not to come out no matter what. I swallow, bracing myself for the rest of the story. I've never said any of this out loud before, not even to the other women I was imprisoned with, and seeing how his people are the responsible party. I ball my fists up, continuing the story without delving too deep into the thought. I can't stop now. And besides, he deserves to know what his people did. The pain they've inflicted. A massive demon tore into the front room, I say, closing my eyes as the memory cuts deep. I couldn't see what it looked like beneath all of the armour, but it was huge. Toklas held the demon off the best he could without a real weapon. He only had the baton and whip all of the guards carry. I think. The demon was playing with him, letting Toklas fight until it decided it was tired of the game. The demon crushed Toklas's head with its bare hands. I watched the whole thing and I started screaming. The demon found me after that. I think I passed out, whether from shock or grief I don't know, but the next thing I remember I woke up in a cell with the others. I take a deep breath, waiting for Kazeth to say something, anything. When he doesn't, I look up at him, stealing myself for the worst. Kazeth only looks at me, and after a moment, opens his mouth as if to say something, before closing it again and looking out the window. You said you know why you're here, is all Kazeth can say. My jaw slackens as I stare at him. What? I ask. I just bared my heart and soul to him told him about the worst thing that's ever happened to me, and he wants to talk about his duty to his king. Fury radiates through me, and I clamp down on the emotion hard, not daring to let it show. I don't know why I was stupid enough to think that he'd care about Toklas, or what happened to either of us. I guess he doesn't have a heart after all. My face warms as I turn away from him, staring at the ground and trying desperately to get a grip. Flying off the handle will only infuriate him, but even knowing that doesn't quell my rage. Do you understand the implications, or must I explain it to you? He asks, that impassive look still etched into every line on his face. Must he salt the wound? Karzeth doesn't seem to care if it upsets me as he begins. You're here because the demon race isn't maintaining itself the way we once could. Fewer and fewer demons are being born every summer. In order to maintain our race, the king has come up with a creative solution, he says, no emotion in his voice. Confusion knots my brow as I look up at him. He doesn't seem all too thrilled with this arrangement either. Perhaps I can use that to my advantage. We are to copulate, he continues, oblivious to my inner monologue. Until you either sire demonic young, or are proven to be an incompatible vessel, the king has commanded this of the both of us, and it's in our best interest to obey. I weigh my options, and decide to throw caution to the wind. Another chance like this might not come up again. So this is a duty to you? Nothing more? I ask tentatively. Kazeth nods sharply, avoiding my gaze. How is he supposed to know that we're breeding? I ask, feigning curiosity, even as my irritation simmers just beneath the surface. Kazeth seems to see right through me anyhow. There is no way around it. Once the king issues an order, all demons, and whomever else the order applies to, must obey. What happens if I'm infertile? I ask half scared of the answer. I don't know, but it's safe to assume you will no longer be a guest in my house, he says. I decide that he's being honest, although in truth I can't really tell. But if neither one of us want, it is not about what either of us want, he snaps, standing abruptly. It is about responsibility, loyalty. It is about survival. 
I press my lips together, willing my chin not to tremble at his sharp tone. We have to begin our duties tonight. Be ready when I come for you, he commands. He doesn't even look at me as he turns on his heel and strides from the room, shutting the door hard behind him. Moments ago, I had been wishing to be left alone, praying for a reprieve from all the noise and bodies crowding into such a small space. Now, the silence hangs heavily in the room, and I'm left alone with nothing but my own dread. Chapter 12 Natalie I stare at the door in shock, the silence in the room heavy like a blanket. I feel like some sordid doll, sitting as still as death tucked beneath silken sheets, waiting for my master to return and do whatever he pleases with me. My stomach churns, and for a moment I think I'm going to be sick. I run to the washroom, my knees hitting the tile in front of the toilet hard as I clutch the basin. Despite the overwhelming nausea, nothing comes. I sit there for a moment, the cold of the porcelain leeching through my torn, dirty clothes. Once I'm certain I'm not in danger of spewing bile all over the room, I drag myself to my feet, using the wall to keep myself steady. I'm about to leave the bathroom when I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror adorning the wall. My face is red and puffy from crying, my eyes bloodshot. The clothes I've been in since Kazeth brought me here are in even worse shape than they were when I first arrived or perhaps they just look worse in contrast with my fine surroundings. Threads are coming loose around the ragged hemlines of my tunic, and the fabric is covered in stains. Salt stains are dotted over my front from my tears, only adding to how dishevelled I look. I try in vain to smooth out the tattered material, before running my fingers through my hair, which is tangled from the upset. I sigh at my reflection turning around to crawl back into bed when there's a knock at my door. My heart races. Is he back already? Surely I can't have spent that long in the bathroom. I peek out the window, ensuring that the sun is still above the horizon. The knock comes again, more insistent this time. Inhaling deeply, I open the door, stealing myself for Kazeth's looming presence. To my shock, it's not Kazeth, but one of the smaller demons, a little shorter than me, dragging a massive trunk. The demon and I stare wide-eyed at each other for a moment, before he gives me a quick bow and shoves the trunk into the room. He leaves it in the middle of the room, before turning tail and sprinting from the room on squat legs. How odd, I think to myself, watching him flee down the hallway with mild amusement. I shut the door behind him, turning to inspect the trunk. Curiosity gets the better of me, as I poke and prod at the worn leather encasing it, and I flip the latch to open the trunk. It's filled to bursting with new dresses, silken slippers tucked along the sides in every colour of the rainbow. I feel the fabrics in wonder, carefully unfolding the dresses and laying them out on the bed. I've never owned anything so lavish. The dresses in the trunk are made of materials I've only ever heard of, and some I don't recognise. Tulle, lace, satin, velvet, with a wide variety of colours and silhouettes. I'm almost giddy playing with the assortment before the reason for all of the new clothing dawns on me. Kazeth wants me to play the part. A familiar nausea manifests in my stomach, and suddenly I'm far less interested in the dresses. The idea of being gussied up like some plaything crawls over my skin, leaving me feeling dirty and hollow. Kazeth isn't willing to pretend for my sake, and has made it abundantly clear that he'll be returning tonight to consummate the king's chosen arrangement. Panic thrums through me as I glance out the window, finding the sun has sunk a little lower in the stormy sky. Heavy clouds are gathering on the horizon, grey and mean, and I can't help but feel that they're an omen of what's to come. I scramble over to the window, taking stock of my surroundings. A small lip sits beneath the window, just wide enough for me to fit my feet on and edge over to the small patch of roof connecting to the garden. Where I'd go from there, I have no idea. But at least I wouldn't be trapped in this room. My resolve strengthens as I think about Kazeth's shadow reappearing in my doorway. This is how it has to be. It's better to run and die fighting than live out my life as nothing more than a broodmare for the demons. My hands are trembling as I reach under the lip of the window, and I give it a sharp push. It doesn't budge. I push harder, hoping that the window is just stuck in place from years of the room being unoccupied, but the window won't open. Only then do I see the small latch on the outside of the window, securing it in place. Shit, 
I think to myself, as I hurry to the next window, trying to open that one as well. I repeat the same process over and over, checking each window in the room and attached washroom, and every single one is locked tight. By the time I'm finished, my heart is nearly pounding out of my chest, panic closing in as I realise that the only way out of this room is through the door. I'm tempted to try my luck, but the only time I've wandered out without someone escorting me, Kazeth was never far behind. For all I know, he has magical wards placed that alert him to my whereabouts in the house. And if Kazeth isn't the one who finds me, it could be the girls, or a servant, or some unknown monstrosity. I'm not prepared to deal with any of it, and I'm certainly in no state to fight a demon, magical or not. I sigh, fighting back the urge to crumple to the ground and cry again. I'm tired of playing the part of the weepy human girl, and I'm tired of being a prisoner everywhere I go, but I can only control one of those things. I turn my attention back toward the dresses, plucking through them in a dejected fashion as I come to terms with the truth of my situation. There is no way out of this, comes the slow realisation. I put on the simplest dress I can find, a muted green cotton shift that hits my calves, and perch on the edge of the bed. The light from the windows is steadily dimming, and magical candles flare to life around the room, casting a warm glow over the dresses spilling out of the trunk. I pace for a while, moving from window to window, always listening for the sound of footsteps or the turning of the handle. Seconds creep by, every minute an eternity. I try to keep myself busy, sorting the dresses and putting them away in the wardrobe, organising and reorganising them in various ways. I consider bathing, or trying to do something about my tangled hair. But I don't want to give Kazeth or anyone else for that matter, the impression that I'm pleased with this situation. So I sit and wait. The silence is suffocating as the dread tickling down my spine. The sun sinks behind the city's horizon, the thick storm clouds undulating and growing darker by the minute, thunder rumbling in the distance. My mind wanders in the quiet, and I can't help but wonder what lying with Kazeth will be like. I'd imagine that since demons seem to be entirely without empathy, they have little regard for tenderness or reciprocation either. That being said, however, I have a hard time imagining Kazeth truly wanting to hurt me in pursuit of his duty. Perhaps it'll just be a quiet affair, another task for him to check off his to-do list in service of the king. I haven't slept with anyone other than Toklis. The first time we made love, it was an awkward affair for me, but it was sweet, and I couldn't get enough of him. Trying to picture Kazeth in Toklis's place in my memories makes me feel dirty. Toklis is dead because of the demons, and here I am, thinking about what it's like to be with one. I wring my hands together, suddenly feeling very cold. I climb under the covers, wrapping the quilt tightly around me to fight off the chill. All of my crying and worrying is beginning to catch up with me, but the idea of waking up to Kazeth's naked body pressing into me sends waves of anxiety through me that keep my eyes peeled open. He said to be ready tonight, that he'd be coming, and yet the sky has been dark for quite some time, and there's no sign of him. Perhaps he's forgotten, or become too busy to worry about our arrangement. Maybe he's changed his mind, and has decided that he doesn't want to go through with it anyway. A small spark of hope settles in my chest at the thought, dispelling the anxiety lingering in my system. I relax into the warm embrace of the bed, my eyelids growing heavy, as I mull over all of the reasons Kazeth hasn't come to my room yet. Maybe he won't come at all. Maybe he'll agree to pretend with me, to let me stay here and be as free as I ever will for a short time, until the king grows wise to the situation and deems me unviable. I cling to this hope as my body gives out on me, slipping into a deep, peaceful sleep. Chapter 13 Kazeth I pace my room, my shoulders drooping under the weight of my conversation with Natalie. The sound of her sobs echoes in my ears as I move about, the image of her small, fragile body bent with grief swimming before my eyes. The raid on Protheca was necessary, I tell myself firmly, trying to dispel the growing seed of discontentment taking root in me the way her voice broke when she said her former lover's name still lingers. Should I tell her? King Asmodeus may have been the one to suggest the raid, but I was the one to coordinate it. 
After the king had informed us of the human woman he was in contact with, it fell to me to organize the mission, and taking on such an important task had been a source of pride for me. Until tonight. Until I'd heard it from Natalie's perspective. Memories of that day flashed through my mind, the images blending with the picture Natalie painted for me when she told me her story. I had remembered the raid honorably, regarding it as a job well done, a flawlessly executed endeavor that had yielded exactly what was promised. Natalie remembers it with horror. She trembled as she recounted blood and tears, and the splintering of wood before her lover was killed by some nameless, faceless Gilak. Her loss writhes in my stomach as if it were my own. My head spins as I try to make sense of the situation and I sink into a nearby chair with a groan. Telling Natalie about my involvement with the raid might very well ruin any possibility of me being able to fulfill my duties. Knowing that I was the reason for her lover's death, however indirectly, is bound to make her hate me. I can't tell her, I decide. There's too much on the line for both of us to risk not doing what needs to be done, and the idea of taking her by force makes my stomach drop. No. She can't know about the raid. I'm responsible for her safety, and including her in the fact that I coordinated the raid would breed neither of those things. I try to convince myself that I'm not taking the coward's way out, that it's better for both of us this way, but a nagging feeling lingers. I'm not sure why the idea of her being unhappy or hating me bothers me so much. The image of her, fraught with anguish, flashes before my eyes again, and I rub my hands over my face, trying to dispel the image from my mind. I'm only worried about her well-being because she's my responsibility while she's here. There is no love lost between the two of us, and this situation has no room for any nostalgic, emotional sentiments. I'm doing my duty to my king and my people, nothing more. My decision is based on logic and reason, not emotions. Magical candles flicker to life around the room, startling me from my thoughts. Time has passed more quickly than I thought, and it's nearly time to return to Natalie's room. I stride to the bathroom, taking stock of my appearance in the mirror. If I'm going to follow through on my orders, the least I can do for Natalie is look presentable. I run a brush through my long silver hair, working out the knots and letting it drape over my shoulders in an impressive mane. The way my hair falls makes my eyes look too piercing, too assertive, and only serves to highlight the dark crown of horns atop my head. I pick the brush back up, rearranging my hair into a ponytail at the nape of my neck. Having all of the small symbols on my face on display looks too intimidating, especially for Natalie in her current state. I don't want to scare her. I sigh, throwing the brush onto the counter and ripping my hair from the band holding it back. I have no idea what I'm so worried about. There's no reason for me to be so concerned about pleasing her. This is an assignment, not a tryst. It'll go more smoothly if it's at least somewhat enjoyable, I tell myself, shoving back the growing notion that there could be something more behind my behavior. There's nothing wrong with wanting this to be pleasurable for us both. I glare at my reflection, seeing myself through Natalie's eyes. My horns are razor sharp, their ends twining toward the sky their pitch-black tone only highlighted by my silvery hair and pale skin. My eyes are pools of black, emotionless in the eyes of a human, sucking in all of the surrounding light. No wonder she's so terrified, I think bitterly to myself, turning away from the mirror. Natalie is the epitome of softness and warmth, all inviting curves and gentle features while I'm, well, a demon. I've never been so concerned with someone else's feelings and it's exhausting. I'm not an egoist by any stretch of the imagination, but I've always felt confident in my endeavors. This is all uncharted territory for me, and I detest the uncertainty. I pick through my wardrobe, thumbing through tunics and overcoats. Many of the items in the wardrobe feel too formal and stuffy. I spend longer than I'd care to admit weighing the options before deciding not to change at all, keeping on my simple black tunic and pants. It might send the wrong message if I change, and I don't want to overwhelm her. I wonder if she's gotten the trunk I sent up to her room. One of the Zonak was supposed to take the new clothing upstairs for her to change into, but seeing as how they're almost entirely useless around the house, 
I can't count on the fact that she would have received anything. And even if she did, she may not have accepted my gift. For all of her tears and softness, Natalie has a stubborn streak that's difficult to contend with. Still, I can't help but picture her in the dresses I'd commissioned. I didn't know what she would like, and didn't have any measurements for her besides a rough estimate. But the tailor promised they would fit, and that any woman would be glad of the collection we compiled. I glance out the window and my heart skips a beat as I realize the sun is well below the horizon, the stars peeking through the gathered storm clouds. How long has it been dark? I take a final look in the mirror, running a hand through my hair before leaving the room and turning toward the west wing. My steps echo through the halls, ominous in the silence. When I'm finally at Natalie's door, I take a deep breath, knocking softly. Natalie? I wait a moment, straining for any kind of response. My heart beats louder in my chest as I knock again, wondering if she heard me. When she doesn't respond again, panic sets in, and I throw the door open. At first glance, the room appears empty, and my pulse quickens at the thought of her having clambered out a window and losing herself somewhere in Tilith. All manner of demons roam the continent outside my manor, and the idea of her being scooped up before I can reach her makes my stomach churn. I'm about to shout for the Zonak when I notice a small form curled under the covers of the bed, her chest rising and falling softly. Relief pours through me as I cross to the bed, observing Natalie's relaxed face, peaceful in sleep. Whatever am I going to do with you? I consider as I gaze down at her sleeping figure. Before I can think better of it, I slide into bed next to her, laying on top of the cream quilt. She stirs slightly as my weight shifts the bed, and I freeze, unsure of what I would say if she were to wake up. Thankfully, Natalie snuggles into the bed with a sleepy sigh as she falls deeper into sleep. A part of me wonders if I should wake her up, but she looks so content, so unafraid, that I can't imagine robbing her of this small reprieve. I watch her sleep for a while, aching to reach out to touch her. My fingers hover tentatively over her hair for a moment before I brush her dark hair softly. The corners of her lips pull up into a sleepy smile at my touch, and my heart swells in my chest as I stroke her hair again. I'm fascinated by the way sleep softens her features, how beautiful and unguarded she looks in the soft candlelight. Natalie's hair is silken under my fingertips and I contemplate touching her face, her lips, but decide against it. I don't want to startle her. Instead, I lay quietly beside her, holding vigil while she sleeps, soaking in her radiant beauty. She smells faintly of sun-warmed earth and new springtime plants. I inhale deeply, unable to get enough of this moment. Of her. All my thoughts of duty and loyalty abandon me as the swell of her breasts rise and fall, the way her lips are parted as she dreams. I can't go through with this. Not tonight. And the idea of forcing anything on her is out of the question. I want to make her look like this. I want her to feel safe, to be happy and at ease, and to know that I would never hurt her. I tuck the quilt tighter around her, and Natalie murmurs sleepily curling in closer to me as if she knows that I am near. I continue stroking her hair tenderly, my decision already made. I will always be near if she wants me to be. I'm going to take care of her. Chapter 14 Natalie I surface from sleep slowly, sunlight seeping through the windows and illuminating the pale blue walls of my room. I blink against the sudden brightness, giving myself time to rouse. I haven't slept this well in ages, although I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that I'm sleeping in such a nice bed and wasn't woken to the sounds of crying or the demons cracking their whips and gnashing their teeth. I smile softly to myself, wondering if I should just spend the day in bed, sleeping and reading, if there is a book I can read. My muscles are tight from sleep, and I extend my arms, fully intending to stretch them out when I freeze. A pale, muscled arm is wrapped around my waist. My heart leaps into my throat, and it's an effort to bite back a surprised yelp as I glance behind me to find Kazeth's face mere inches from my own, slack with sleep. 
Why in the thirteens' names is he in my bed? The memories of our conversation last night come flooding back, and terror chases up my spine. The last thing I remember, I fell asleep alone in this bed. Kazeth never came up to make good on his demand. Did he come upstairs to fulfil his duty? Did he drug me so I wouldn't make it more difficult for him? My mind races as fear grips me. I thought he wouldn't hurt me. I thought he wasn't like the others who reveled in our suffering. Why would he do this to me? Was I foolish to let my guard down, even when I thought he had given up? Before I can work out what to do next, Kazeth stirs behind me, mumbling and shifting his weight. I go rigid, unsure of what I can do. Do I run? Do I scream? What if he isn't done with me yet? I watch as Kazeth slowly wakes, fear and fury mingling. Unable to keep a hold on my temper any longer, I throw his arm off of me and sit up, pressing my back into the headboard of the bed as I draw the covers up to my chest. What did you do? I hiss at him. Kazeth looks up at me, not moving from where he lays on top of the quilt, blinking once, twice. What? He grumbles, his voice thick with sleep. Why are you in my bed? What did you do to me? My voice rises in pitch, but I can't find it in me to care. He violated me, drugged me, or cast a spell on me or something so I didn't wake up. And he's playing coy. Kazeth shakes his head, having the nerve to look confused. I want to scream, I want to hit him or throw something at him, but more than anything else, I just want him to get out of my bed. Get out, I tell him, my tone venomous. Get out! Kazeth finally sits up, slow understanding dawning on him as he looks around the room. Natalie, wait! I said get out. Natalie, just listen. No! I shriek back at him at the top of my lungs. I will not listen. You put some sort of spell on me. You snuck into my room in the dead of night, and you had your way with me while I was unconscious. Kazeth's mouth goes slack in horror, and he reaches a hand out as if to grab me. I dodge his hand, rolling out of the bed and scrambling to my feet as soon as I hit the floor. My back is pressed against the wall, my eyes glued to him as he clambers off of the bed, raising himself up to his full height as he stares at me. Kazeth takes a step toward me, and my instincts set in. I throw a nearby pillow at him, hoping to slow him down as I sprint to the washroom. I hear his footsteps close behind me as I slam the door, my hands trembling as I latch it shut. Natalie, nothing happened, he shouts from the other side of the door. Don't lie to me, I scream back at him, angry tears falling down my cheeks. Just go, leave me alone. Natalie, unlock this door, he growls. I said leave, I shout back, pushing all my weight against the door. Terror racks my brain, my body shakes as I hold the doorknob in place. Just come out here so we can talk about this, Kazeth says, exasperation and something like pleading colouring his tone. I won't fall for it. I won't let him hurt me again. I say nothing, maintaining my stance and accusation. Natalie? His tone is somewhat solemn, but I can't let myself be fooled. I remain silent. I can't believe I trusted him. I can't believe I was stupid enough to believe that he might care about me in some sick, deranged way. Kazeth sighs from the other side of the door, sinking against the door until he is seated. We need to talk about this, he says, sounding more tired than I've ever heard him. I don't respond, choking back the sob coming up my throat. How dare he demand more of me, as if what he's already done isn't enough. I refuse to be bullied into giving up more of myself. I refuse to let him take the last bit of dignity I have left. I won't give in to this ploy. Kazeth sits outside of the door for what feels like an eternity before he climbs to his feet again. I'll have the Zonak bring food up for you, he says. His footsteps fall heavily as he walks away, the sound receding as I hear my bedroom door click shut. A sob breaks through my lips once I'm sure he's gone, and I sink to my seat, allowing myself time to cry about this newest horror. Once I'm out of tears, I draw a hot bath, wanting to scrub this feeling off of me until my skin is raw. The sound of running water echoes in the washroom as I stare at my reflection, stealing myself for what I'm about to do. It would be easier to pretend it didn't happen, to act as if nothing was wrong. But I know I have to check, if only to confirm for myself that I'm not crazy. I peel the chemise off as I check myself in the mirror, looking for any signs of bruises, but find none. Using my fingertips, I press lightly into my neck and arms, checking to see if I'm tender or sore anywhere, but again, I find nothing. 
Doubt begins to creep in as I'm examining myself, but I push it away. Just because he didn't leave a mark doesn't mean nothing happened. There's only one way to truly know if he fulfilled his duty last night. Gently, reluctantly, I press my fingers between my thighs, checking myself for any abrasions or soreness, or any other telltale sign that I was penetrated. There's none. I'm not sore or hurt. There are no bruises. There's no tenderness anywhere. Absolutely no sign of anything having happened. I climb into the bath, that creeping feeling of doubt clawing around in my stomach. I replay the morning's events in my head, the way Kazeth looked confused and then horrified as our conversation progressed. Something clicks in my mind that makes me want to sink beneath the water and never emerge. Kazeth was sleeping on top of the bed, not under the covers. He was fully clothed, and so was I. Scolding humiliation coats every nerve, every cell in my body, as I realise that Kazeth was telling the truth. He didn't touch me last night, save for wrapping an arm around my waist. I bury my face in my hands, vague memories of having my hair stroked, and a warm body holding me coming flooding back. I don't know why he came into my room last night, or why he fell asleep in my bed, but he didn't hurt me. He comforted me. He watched over me and kept me safe. I groan, tempted to rip my own hair out with embarrassment. I've made an absolute fool of myself and accused him of being a monster when he's done nothing wrong. I don't know how I'm supposed to face him after this. The full weight of my realisation only bears down on me further, as I think back to my time here, in Kazeth's home. He's never said a foul word to me, never made any move to hurt me. He's fed me and clothed me and given me a type of privacy and respect I've never experienced before. He even chased his own family away from me when he realised I was overwhelmed and asked me about my life, about Toklas, and held me when I cried. I've never felt more ashamed of myself in my life. I eventually drag myself out of the bath, drying myself off and putting on another of the simpler dresses Kazeth gave me, a silky, rust-coloured dress that barely reaches the floor. Even the dresses he's bought me are modest, I think to my chagrin as I run a brush through my hair. I don't know how I could possibly make this right, but I guess I can start with an apology. True to his word, Kazeth had food delivered to my room, a wide array of fruits and pastries on a tray beside my bed. My shame only deepens at the sight of it, knowing he made that promise to me when I was screaming at him to leave. A part of me wants nothing more than to hide in my bed all day, eating the food Kazeth sends up and pretending that nothing is amiss, but I can't bring myself to ignore what's right. Stealing my nerves, I head downstairs to find Kazeth and offer him the apology he deserves. I only hope he'll accept it. Chapter 15 Kazeth Magic crackles along my skin as I stomp out of the room, confused. This is my home. These are my walls. And yet I feel lost as I stare at Natalie's closed bedroom door. I linger in front of it, but she refuses to open the door no matter what I say. Eventually I give up. Her sobs are so loud they can be heard at the end of the hall, where I pause and grip my horns in abject frustration. I did nothing. By the gods, this woman is infuriating. She's about as trusting as a razor fiend, and her emotions change as quickly as the electric storms that roar above us. One moment she's so tender-hearted that she cries over a stranger's death and clings to me for comfort, and the next she's accusing me of manipulating her, of using her. I still can't believe I fell asleep in her bed. For a moment it felt like I might belong next to her. She'd smiled in her sleep, and something had tugged in my chest. I couldn't bear to leave her. Not yet. And then my eyelids grew heavy, watching her dream. Then. For a moment it had been peaceful, holding her in my arms as we woke. I hadn't known I could sleep so well. Enough, I tell myself. Enough. If she's going to be as capricious as the storms above, then she can have her bed all to herself. I'm done trying to win her over with pleasantries and gentle words. If any of my fellow demons could see me now, I can only imagine how they'd sneer at the sniveling creature I've become attempting to win a human's trust over my duties. 
For a dark moment, I considered taking her by force. If she's going to accuse me of such a thing, why not? It's what any other demon would do in my position. But the mere thought of her terrified screams twists my stomach, and bile burns in my throat. No, I can't be the one to cause her pain. It's been difficult enough seeing her cry over others. It tears at me like a fresh wound. Whatever she might think of me and my kind, hurting her like that is not something I could stomach. I can see why the prince failed. What a mockery the court had made of him. Not overtly, of course. No one could survive that. But in secret coves, in whispers. Even I had thought him something of a farce after his elopement with the human from the arena. I grit my teeth until my sharp canines threaten to slice through my gums, and the pain helps clear my mind. It's morning, and I have other duties. The fickle human must wait. I set thoughts of her aside, but her tearful accusations echoes in my head as I step into the kitchen. Did I overstep? Sleeping in her bed? It hadn't been my intention. She came from so much worse, even on Protheca. I'm a storm inside, cascading from regret to rage in the span of an instant. The Zonax servants in the kitchen must sense my mood because they give me a wide berth as I storm about, casting spells and summoning food. I ought to let her starve until she sees fit to walk down to the kitchen and grovel for forgiveness. But I promised her I would send it. Take this up. I filled silver platters with fruits and pastries, eggs and meats. They carry them upstairs, slightly swaying beneath the weight of the offering. It's more than she can eat. But maybe I want to prove a point. She's never eaten this well in her life, I'm sure of it. Her sharp bones are dangerously prominent beneath her olive flesh, and her eyes are a bit too hollow in her skull. The care I've shown her is such that even her beloved dark elf lover couldn't hope to match it. Talkless. His name alone makes me want to spit fire. At least he's dead. But I can't even take pleasure in that, because of her heartbroken eyes as she'd confessed how a demon had crushed his skull between their bare hands. He'd given her what? Bread? I can give her more. Much more. She's a fool not to see it. Kazeth? A high, lilting voice comes from behind me. I turn to face my nieces, who seem to have just woken, themselves. Has this platter displeased you? Or is it just a bad morning? Or is it the human? Who cares? Valindra yawns and elbows past her nosy sisters, plopping down at the table without so much as opening her eyes. I'm starving. Kazeth, please. I set the platter on the gleaming onyx counter and resume pacing. I am not your servant. The Zonak will return shortly. But I'm hungry now. Valindra finally opens her eyes and sniffs the air pointedly. It smells like you've already summoned breakfast. But whoever for? Valencia scowls and pokes an insolent finger at my belly. For himself. Selfish. You're old enough to summon your own food, I reply, gritting my teeth. Tanulia grins, teeth sharp. Would you truly like us to try that again? I bite back a groan. I'd had to borrow Zonak servants from another estate the last time they tried it, and it had taken days of spells to repair the walls. They were so stained with food. I don't know if their collective spell work is that deficient, or if it was a purposeful attack on my residence, but I'm not eager to try again. Not with everything else going on. Fine, fine. The platter clangs on the table and my magic sparks stronger than usual. It takes me longer than it should to focus, and their inane prattle is not helping. Silence for one moment, please. Only if you promise to summon... No. I glower at Alincia, and she grins back. All the child wants is sweets. It's a wonder she still has teeth. You will eat what I give you. She wants the Protheca-style pastries I summoned for Natalie but I refuse to indulge her in this. A demon's main diet is meat. The more bloody, the better, supplemented with rare, spindly herbs from the harvest. Since the humans and the dark elf slaves have arrived, our diets have become more corrupted. I will not have this for my sister's children. They are spoiled enough. Meat, plentiful and raw, appears on the platter. They look at me, crestfallen. 
I look them over, resolved in my decision. Finally, Alincia lowers her eyes. Her lower lip trembles. She extends her utensil towards the table with a trembling hand. We humbly thank you, she begins to say. Fine, I snap. I am surrounded by ingrates. Furious magic crackles and pastries and fruits join the meat. Here. The girls chatter, excited, and Alincia grins at me as she fills her plate. You must take meat as well or I'll evaporate all of it. Yes, Kazeth, the girls recite in unison, taking the smallest possible portion. Alincia tries to take three pastries, but her older sister zaps the third from her hand before she can shove it in her mouth. Hey, she whines. If they fight now, I think I might evaporate the table. My tenuous temper hangs by a string. Their voices rise, and then their sister joins in, just to be a part of the clamor. I shut my eyes and recite spellwork in my head. Spells I haven't thought about since I was a boy, just to keep from destroying my entire manor. I've no energy for any of this. The Zonak should serve breakfast, but they've just begun to clean the main living hall. I don't have the patience to once again explain to them what their jobs entail. When directed, they're efficient enough, but they truly must be directed at all times, and it's not so much work to summon a plate from the cabinet and fill it with meat. Naturally, by the time I serve myself, I sense a presence in the archway. I turn so that I can instruct the Zonak to begin cleaning the table once we've finished eating, and not during. If I don't make myself clear, they're likely to make off with my plate before I finish. But it isn't a Zonak at all. Natalie stands, hands clasped in front of her. She's washed her face clean of tears, but the whites of her eyes are still red. It takes her a while to look up from her feet. Has she come for a purpose? Or is she trying to blend in with the wall? The girls share a curious look, and my shoulders stiffen. Has she come to tell them I'm a monster? To repeat the slander from before in front of my girls? I didn't like hearing it the first time, and I don't want my nieces to hear it at all. Even though it would be within my rights to take her as I wish, something inside me doesn't want the girls to suspect me of such a thing. I press my palms against the table and rise to my feet. Every step I take towards her, I expect her to flee. Even the Zonak from the next room have paused their work. All eyes are on Natalie, not that she sees them. She stares at the floor with unblinking eyes. Well, my voice is rough. I don't try to be gentle. Sanding my rough edges around her hasn't worked so far, and I've given up trying. I'm a demon. And I speak like one. Are you going to join us or not? Chapter 16. Natalie. My legs shake as I stand in the hallway leading to the dining hall. Karzeth's nieces chatter cheerfully, but he remains gruff. Several times they ask him for more food, and he gives in, but always with a sharp word. His temper seems even worse than usual. Is it because of me? Maybe I should go back to my room, but the Zonak watch me with lazy interest from the corner. They'll tell him that I was here, and then I'll have even more to explain. It's better to get things over with quickly, instead of letting my anxiety build. Resolved, I decide to apologise immediately but once I take a step into the actual arch, I freeze, I can walk no further. My heart hammers in my throat, and my feet refuse to move. The demon girls stop talking immediately. How much do they know about my accusations? I was so loud. Did they hear me? I shut my eyes and force a shaky breath. Gods, what had I been thinking to accuse him of such a thing, even if he had done it? On Protheca, most dark elves would have cut out my tongue for such words. Or worse. And this place, this strange, perpetually stormy world that resembles all of my grandmother's whispered stories about a place she called hell, doesn't seem like the sort of place humans are forgiven. The Trovlar demon who terrorised me during my initial captivity made that very clear. Protheca was bad enough. This place is worse. I'm not sure I want to know what they do to humans like me here. Karzeth's shoulders hunch above his plate, and then he turns his horned head. 
When he sees me, his black eyes widen and then narrow. For a strange moment, his face looks as though I've slapped him. He did not expect me. I'm not sure if I'm being foolish or brave. Perhaps it would have been best to remain in my room. I remind myself of the small kindnesses he's shown me. I may have thrown them in his face, but he didn't need to treat me so well. Perhaps he won't hurt me. But he might give me away to someone who will. Fear and guilt make me shake again, and I twine my fingers together, trying to hide my raw nerves. The girls whisper excitedly to one another, but they remain in their seats at the imposingly tall table. Well? His eyes rake over my new dress, and then back to the table dismissively. Are you going to join us or not? His voice is so rough that it takes me time to pass the meaning of his words. And even then, at first, I believe I've misheard. I'm sorry. A flick of his finger sends a tall, heavy chair scooting away from the breakfast-laden table. If you'd like to eat, then sit. I will not have you idling in the hall. It's bad manners. The youngest girl rolls her eyes, and her sister steals a pastry from her plate. Hey, she yells. Are you sure that's okay? I ask. He'd sent up mountains of food earlier with the servants, but my stomach had been wound so tight that I hadn't managed to take a bite. I'm beginning to read his expressions better now. When I first arrived, his general demeanour had been so terrifying that I just assumed he was always furious. But now I see the slight twist to his brow and the downward tilt to his lips. His black eyes are not easy to read, but also not impossible. He looks confused. There is food and you are hungry. His brow wrinkles even further. What is there to debate? Another twist to my stomach. Not hunger, guilt. I still want to apologise, but not in front of his wards. Later, I think. We should have a private conversation. I've been so terrified he'll hurt me, and all he's done is send me up food and new clothing, and then invite me to sit down and eat a meal with his family. It's surreal. Even with Tocliss, who'd loved me, I had never imagined being welcome at a dinner with his family. It was unheard of for a human to dine with elves as equals. A Zonak trudges inside the kitchen and fetches me a plate, and the girls watch as I fill it with fruits and pastries. Why doesn't she have to eat meat? The youngest whines. She's human, Karzeth snaps. I look at the meat in question, raw and bleeding on the plate. Do humans eat meat? The oldest girl smiles at me, and I must be getting accustomed to demons because her sharp incisors hardly faze me any longer. My name is Valindra, by the way. And this is Tanulia, and the one stuffing her face with pastries is Alintia. Alintia's face is covered with sugar, and she flashes her sharp teeth at me. I eat meat sometimes, I say, trying to ignore how Kazeth's eyes bore into me as I speak. Unspoken words hang heavy in the air between us, and it's a relief to speak of something light-hearted instead. If it's cooked. Cooked, Alintia marvels. Can I see your teeth? I swallow and then take a sip of water. Their water tastes odd here. I'm not sure if it's because it's summoned, or because of the storms above, but it tastes oddly electric, like it sparks along my tongue. I smile wide. Alincia reaches to pull my lips further apart, but her older sister stops her hand. I guess they're a little sharp, she says skeptically, but there are a lot of flat teeth there. That's why she can eat so many pastries. Kazeth retorts. I'm not sure now is the right time for a lecture on human dental hygiene, but I'm not eager for breakfast to end either. So I talk about healers and how teeth require care. This seems to please Kazeth unexpectedly, because he gives a pointed look to Alincia and she crosses her arms, petulant. Teeth are extremely important, he agrees. If you cannot flay the flesh of your enemies with nothing more than your teeth, what could be more shameful? I don't have anything to say to that. I take a bite of fruit instead. It looks like something crafted by someone with a passing familiarity with a tisret fruit from Protheca. But it tastes. Overly sweet, without its characteristic tang. That and the silvery, metallic sheen on its skin makes me realise it's been crafted by magic instead of grown. Do you create all your food here? The question escapes me before I think it through, and I cringe. It's one thing to speak when spoken to, but to ask a question of a dark elf on Protheca would more likely than not invite a sharp backhand to the face. But my hosts are not insulted at all. Karzeth, amazingly, almost smiles. Do you like it? I nod. 
I almost say that the fruit is similar to one back home, but I worry that he's tried to recreate it. I don't want to tell him that he's failed. I can perfect it if you like. He almost looks embarrassed. I wanted you to be comfortable and so I have spoken with the Sosgaroth acquainted with the palace. Prince Reg Thorek has requested we summon food to please his human mate, Laura. Laura, the traitor. The reason Toklis is dead. The reason I sit at a table, surrounded by more food than I've ever seen in my entire life. Part of me wants to ask more questions, because I have no idea what a Sosgaroth is, or what magic allows them to summon food, or why a prince would work so hard to win the favour of a human. But mixed feelings paralyse my tongue. Tanulia pushes her blonde hair from her face and blinks at me with mischievous black eyes. Hers are similar to her uncle's, but with white surrounding them. You do not like her. The other girls, sensing juicy gossip, lean forward over the table. Did you want the prince instead? No. My voice isn't sharp, but it's final. I've never met him before. I take a breath and smile to soften the word, but Kazeth has already begun speaking about their various engagements of the day, and the girls give me a cheerful wave as they push away from the table. They aren't upset at all. Something in my chest unwinds. How long has it been since I haven't had to make myself demure in order to please others? In order to stay alive? Who am I without that constant fear flowing in my veins? I don't know the answer to any of those questions. I've been scared as long as I've been alive. I turn to Kazeth, who fiddles with his utensil, an empty plate before him. Can I afford to speak my mind here, or is this another trick? Our shared gaze locks. I know I should apologise for falsely accusing him of doing terrible things to me, but it's difficult to muster up the courage. I suddenly miss the girls, and the excuse to chatter on about mundane things. The girls leave for their rooms, the doors shut, and even the Zonak servants leave once they've cleaned the table from our meal. I tear my eyes from him and gaze out the window. It's no picturesque view. Thunder rumbles so loud that the windows shake. Purple lightning dances across the sky, reflecting the turmoil inside me. I have to apologise, but I have no idea how. Chapter 17. Kazeth. Natalie and I stare at each other over our plates, the sounds of the girls' conversation fading as they go to their rooms. She didn't believe me when I tried to explain myself earlier, but I don't entirely blame her, even if her accusations crippled a part of me I didn't know existed. That familiar ire threatens to crowd out my ability to reason, but I smother it, unwilling to let her continue to believe that I would hurt or violate her in the way she believes I have. I don't know what to say, what to do to make her believe me. The truth of last night is humiliating enough without having to put words to it, but I have to try, even if she's unwilling to believe that a demon could possibly possess any penchant for tenderness. I open my mouth, hoping that once I start speaking, the words will come freely. But Natalie beats me to the punch. I'm sorry. The statement comes as such a shock that it doesn't occur to me to close my mouth. I gape at her, sitting quietly like a fool in my chair, while she looks down at her hands in her lap. I'm sorry for this morning, she repeats softly, catching my eyes for a brief second before looking back down. It was unfair of me to accuse you of that. It wasn't unfair, I say, finally finding my voice. I hold her gaze as her eyes dart to mine, surprise and confusion knitting her brows together. You awoke to me in your bed, with no memory of how I'd gotten there. The last conversation we had, I told you I was coming to... Make good on the king's demands. It was a natural leap, given our circumstances, not to mention everything you've been through. I watch her carefully, noting the relief on her face before continuing. However, I say slowly, I'd appreciate the opportunity to speak with you calmly before you jump to conclusions the next time there's a misunderstanding. Natalie nods, though the crease between her brows doesn't smooth. Why were you in my bed? she asks, uncommonly direct. I shift uncomfortably, not entirely certain how to answer her question without sounding wholly pathetic. I had remembered our... 
Engagement a bit later than I'd intended, I reply, suddenly finding a piece of lint on the sleeve of my tunic. Very interesting. By the time I got to your room, you were already asleep. I knocked, but when you didn't answer, I was concerned that something had happened, so I let myself in. You looked so peaceful, sleeping in that bed, that I didn't want to wake you. I don't know what came over me, I admit, hating the embarrassment coating my words. I must have fallen asleep. Trying to regain some semblance of the dignity befitting a Sosgaroth of my standing, I look up, keeping my chin high as I look her in the eyes. I apologize for violating your privacy. It won't happen again. A small smile plays on Natalie's lips as she holds my gaze, surveying me with careful wonder. She nods thoughtfully, her eyes roving over my face as if to judge the sincerity of my words before nodding again. I appreciate the apology, she says. I sigh, relieved that we've reached a conclusion and can put this whole mess of a morning behind us. Might we start over? I ask, the words coming faster than I intend. Natalie laughs, the sound reminding me of running water and the way a soft breeze teases the branches of trees. It occurs to me that I've never heard her laugh before, and I can't help but wonder when the last time was that she felt free enough to do so. I'd like that, she admits, laughter still lacing her voice. I can't help the smile tugging at my lips. I'm Kazeth. I reply, Natalie's smile growing again. Hi, Kazeth. I'm Natalie, she grins, a teasing glint in her eye. I don't bother hiding my pleasure at this turn of events, grinning widely at her. We stare at each other quietly for a minute, grinning like a pair of fools, before I come to my senses. I summon another course of food, being sure to include pastries and fruits that would be familiar to Natalie from her time on Protheca. She smiles, reaching for another pastry, before turning to me with an inquisitive look. How do you do that? Summon food? She asks as she nibbles on the edge of her sweetbread. I've never seen magic like that before. I shrug, a small swell of pride filling me at her awe. Chaos magic is a fickle thing, but I figure starting with the basics is the best way to answer her question. I'm a Sazgaroth. You'll notice during your time here that there are different types of demons, all with different abilities and suited to different roles. Sosgaroths have a natural penchant for chaos magic, some of us more than others, I add playfully, eliciting a grin from Natalie as she rolls her eyes. Well, you still haven't answered my question, oh mighty Sosgaroth, she quips back, playful sarcasm dancing in her voice. I like this side of her, this easy teasing banter. I find myself hoping that it'll linger during our time together. You have to start somewhere, I chide her gently before continuing. Chaos magic is an unstable, extremely powerful type of magic, very different to the type of magic dark elves and other beings wield. These, I brush my hair aside, exposing the markings on my face more clearly, allow me to harness and direct it without leveling my surroundings. Natalie's mouth opens, almost certainly to point out that I still haven't answered her question, but I continue before she has the chance to needle me further about summoning food. Using chaos magic allows me to summon whatever it is that I desire, be it food, weapons, or other objects. It also allows me to relocate, in a word, items from anywhere I please. Where do things go when you want to relocate them? Where does the food come from? How does chaos magic even work? Natalie rattles off her questions faster than I can answer them, her eyes wide in wonder, a hand tucked beneath her chin as she leans forward. I bite back a laugh at how much it reminds me of talking to the girls. Chaos magic isn't easily explained, especially over breakfast, I tell her, but everything comes at a price. I have to be wary of how I expend my energy, and careful not to take it from the wrong source. The food can be summoned from where it's already prepared in the kitchens, or I can borrow the ingredients from other places and will it into whatever it is I'd like. When I dismiss it, or anything else for that matter, it goes where I want it to. I can either dispose of it like I would anything else, sending it to another location on this plane, 
Or it can go to a sort of in-between space where I can summon it again without expending too much power. There are limits to what I can do, just like anything else, I continue. I can't typically summon people or other sentient beings, and I can't read minds or bend others to my will. The obvious relief on Natalie's face has me stifling another laugh, settling for a wide smile instead. Natalie hums thoughtfully as she surveys the food before us, as if she could figure out where it came from by looking hard enough at it. I push my chair back, rising to my feet and offering Natalie my arm. Would you like to accompany me on a walk around the gardens? I ask, eager to show off more. I don't know where all of this confidence is coming from, but the way her eyes widen in wonder, how awestruck she is by the simplest components of my world, makes me hungry to show her more. Gladly, she responds, smiling up at me as she twines her small hand through the crook of my elbow. I lead us out of the French doors into the gardens, drinking in the obvious amazement on her face as she surveys the plot of artfully kept plants. Natalie extends a hand, brushing her fingertips along the petals of a golden topiary. She glances at me as if to ask permission to explore, and I nod, offering her a small smile. She returns it before relinquishing my arm, wandering down the winding paths, stopping occasionally to touch or smell various plants. I trail behind her, giving her the space to enjoy the garden in a way I never have. I'd never considered what my world may look like through human eyes. All of the things I consider to be mundane and ordinary become extraordinary with Natalie beside them. Something stirs in me, watching her smile and frolic amongst the metallic and black hues of the garden. Even with the undercurrent of the expectations placed upon us, I find myself wanting to please her. I pluck a silvery, full, Lelanian blossom from a nearby bush before striding over to Natalie and offering it to her. She grins, her pleasure with the flower palpable. She accepts it, tucking it behind her ear, before leaning up onto the tips of her toes and pressing a soft kiss against my cheek. Stunned, I pull back slightly, my eyes finding hers as she gives me a sweet, coy smile. What was that for? I ask, not bothering to keep the surprise out of my voice. Natalie giggles as she looks at me, giving me a one-shouldered shrug. For being such a gentleman. I smile at her, shocked at the softness such a small, fragile human can evoke from me. We stand there for a moment looking at each other, before something in Natalie's gaze sobers. I think... I think I'd like to try, she says softly, still holding my gaze. Try? I ask, not catching her meaning. Try. You know, to work with whatever this... She motions between the two of us. Is. My brows pull together, concern seeping into our otherwise enjoyable conversation. Surely she can't think that I'm doing this in an attempt to get what I want. I'm about to ask as much when Natalie cuts me off. And no, before you ask, I haven't changed my mind because I feel I don't have another choice. I know you wouldn't force anything on me. I just think, why not make the best of the situation we're in? I know you can't do anything about it, and neither can I. But maybe this all happened for a reason. My shock doubles as she finishes, and I'm at a loss for words as I take her in. Natalie chews her lower lip nervously, breaking my stare. Just promise to be gentle with me, okay? Of course, I reply quickly, unable to stop myself as I draw her into my arms. I'll be as gentle as you want me to be, I murmur, my gaze dropping to her lips as the distance between us closes. In lieu of a response, Natalie lifts her face to mine, parting her lips slightly in a small sigh. This time I take the hint and lower my lips to hers in a soft, lingering kiss. Chapter 18 Kazeth I feel like a whelpling again. Since that searing kiss that Natalie and I shared in the garden, there's a fire roaring in my core, desire and something I can't quite place pulsing through my veins. I've promised to be gentle with her, and I'm determined to keep my word, but Natalie brings something out in me that is going to make it very, very difficult to control myself. 
After we finish our walk in the gardens, I escort Natalie to her room, promising to return soon and telling her she has free reign of the estate in my absence, although I doubt she'll take advantage of it with the triplets running about. Upon leaving, I instruct one of the Zonak to look after her, telling him that she is not to be treated as a prisoner, but that she is a guest and is to be kept safe at all costs while I'm away. If he fails in absolutely any regard or displeases her in the slightest, I have no qualms killing him on the spot, and I tell him as much. Knowing that she's waiting for me at home sends a thrill running down my spine as the carriage jostles over the road. For some reason, Natalie makes me nervous. Nervous in a way I haven't been in a very, very long time. I'm a powerful, dangerous Sazgaroth for Nedia's sake. And here I am, pining and daydreaming over a human woman. Even feeling as ridiculous as I do, however, I can't shake the excitement I feel for what's to come this evening. I've never shared the same sentimentality surrounding my relationships and bedding women, but I'd be a fool to say that this dynamic is anything like my previous trysts, so I want desperately to do right by her. Worrying over someone else's feelings and expectations is still very new to me, but I hope she can see that I'm trying. Tonight needs to be perfect. I want to prove to her that I'm serious about what I've said, that I'm not going to treat her the way the Dark Elves have. We may be following through on the King's orders by sleeping together, but I don't want her to think that's the only reason things are unfolding the way that they are between us. Tonight is my chance to woo her, and although I'm feeling lost, I don't want to squander the opportunity. The carriage lurches to a halt outside of the King's botanical gardens, a favorite mingling spot for the most prestigious of demons, and no doubt where I'll find Moran. Moran was Dranatha's best friend from the time we were children, and even after Dranatha died, Moran made it a point to stay close to me and the girls. All three of the triplets absolutely adore their Auntie Em. Moran and I are good friends, although I've sought out her company and advice far less often since Dranatha succumbed to the fading. Seeing her reminds me too much of my twin and brings up painful memories that are easier left in the past, but given my current situation, I can think of no one better to turn to for advice. The botanical gardens are alive with the sounds of running water and birdsong, the space enchanted by the most talented of Sazgaroths to be a beacon of power and luxury in constant bloom. Socialites move through the flora, matrons scattered amongst them in search of their newest prey. I move deeper into the gardens, doing my best to look as unapproachable as possible. I have no interest in the mindless chatter of social climbers, and although I catch the eyes of some of the matrons, I keep my head down, plowing toward the sitting area. I spot Moran seated at a black, ornate table that seems to be elegantly carved from a single block of obsidian, her gold dress catching the light and matching the surrounding flowers so precisely that she almost looks as if she were a part of the garden herself. Swaths of potential suitors surround Moran, all vying for her attention as she giggles and fans herself, her long, raven-black hair gleaming in the afternoon sun as she basks in their attention. Their chatter falls silent as I approach, the different males sizing me up as competition. I hope I'm not interrupting, I say, not meaning a word of it. Moran turns her violet eyes toward me, her face lighting up with pleasure. Kaseth, she exclaims standing to wrap me in a warm embrace, much to the chagrin of several of her surrounding suitors. I return her embrace awkwardly, far too aware of how territorial demon males can become over potential mates. What are you doing here? she asks, pulling away to better see me. Is something wrong? Are the girls okay? The girls are fine, I reassure her. I had something I wanted to speak with you about. Privately. Moran doesn't bother to hide her curiosity, a mischievous glint in her eyes as she turns back to her suitors. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, she says with a cloying sweetness. They all murmur their terse agreement, looking at her and shifting on their feet, but make no move to walk away. Now, she snaps at them, all sweetness in her voice gone. The males flee at her tone, wise enough to know better than to incur a matron's wrath. Moran turns back to me, all smiles again, and motions for me to sit. So who is she? Moran asks, cutting right to the chase. 
A part of me is offended that she finds me so transparent, and I feign ignorance. Who? Moran tisks, waving her hand in the air as if to dismiss my query. Come now, Kazeth. You don't seek me out for months except to invite me to come to see the girls. And then all of a sudden, you brave the gardens to speak privately with me about something, she says, an eyebrow raised as she repeats my words. The only reason you do that is if there was a woman involved. So, who is she? she asks again. Matrons are notoriously impatient, Moran even more so than the rest, so while I detest the fact that she's seen right through me, I decide it's in my best interests not to play any games. Her name is Natalie, I mumble. Moran motions for me to continue, interest written all over her face. She's... different. What do you mean, different? She's a human. Moran blinks in shock, silence falling between us for a moment, before she bursts out laughing. I growl, heat rising in my face. What's so funny? I snap at her, losing my temper. Oh, Kazeth. A human? Only you would finally fall to your knees before a silly mortal girl, she says between laughs, wiping tears from the corners of her eyes. Moran sighs as if recovering, before her violet eyes sober slightly. Is this part of Asmodeus's new orders? Only Moran dares to drop the king's title in public, her rank as one of his favorite consorts protecting her from any of the more grievous consequences for doing so. Although I doubt he'd like it very much outside of the bedroom. I nod in lieu of a response, not interested in any more of her teasing. If it's just part of your orders, then what's the big fuss about? She asks, realization dawning on her before I can respond. Oh, she says quietly as she searches my face. Oh. I nod again, not trusting myself to try and put any of what I'm feeling into words. This is a dangerous game you're playing, Kazeth, Moran murmurs, patting my hand softly. Are you sure this is the route you want to take? I don't know that it's something I have much control over, I admit as I hold her gaze. Moran nods thoughtfully before her typical bubbly demeanor returns as she flicks her fan out. Well, you know how sex works, so I doubt that's why you sought me out, she teases as she fans herself. What is it you need my help with? I swallow my pride, trying not to let my embarrassment show. How do I win her over? Oh, easy, Moran says flippantly, waving her free hand in the air. All women are the same, whether they're humans or demons or anything else. All you need to do is listen, but don't bend. Listen, but don't bend? I ask, not bothering to mask my confusion. Moran nods. Take what she wants and says into consideration, but don't obey her every command like some hound, she explains in a matter-of-fact tone, wrinkling her nose in disgust at the notion. You need to take the lead and do things on your terms while still honoring her wishes. Moran says it like it's the simplest thing in the world, but I'm still lost. I snarl, my frustration getting the better of me. But how? Moran smiles and rolls her eyes at my irritation clearly enjoying toying with me. You males. Always making things harder than it needs to be, she chides. For example, if you're going to be betting her soon, make sure she finds her pleasure, but do it on your terms. Bring her to your bed, on your time. By taking the lead and being firm but adaptable, you'll earn her respect. Firm but adaptable, I mumble under my breath, trying to make sense of the words. Moran's grin only widens as she pats me on the shoulder. You'll be fine, she says with a smile, although a bit of worry still lingers in her eyes. Just be smart about this. Asmodeus doesn't like it when he doesn't get what he wants. I nod, rising to my feet. Thank you, I say as I prepare myself to leave. She nods, her eyes never leaving me. Truly, Moran, thank you for everything. She smiles sadly at me, understanding what I've left unsaid, only letting the pain of the moment linger for a second before waving me off. Now go. You're scaring off all my suitors, Moran says, faking the lightness in her voice. You mean victims, I mutter as I turn away, smiling at her laughter over my shoulder as I leave the gardens. 
The carriage is still waiting for me where I left it, and I climb in, beyond ready to be home. Firm but adaptable. I think I can do that. Chapter 19. Natalie. I pace around the baby blue room, hardly seeing my surroundings. Why on earth did I agree to this? Maybe it was a moment of weakness. After all, Kazeth was being so kind to me, and I haven't had anyone look at me like that since Toklas, without judgment or expectation. I didn't know how much I missed it. That tenderness, that desire from a potential partner. Maybe that useless primal part of me kicked in. The second I felt safe, was clothed and fed and sheltered from harm, I became a helpless, demure little woman again, desperate for security and seeking it the only way I know how. Do I only want him for what he can provide? Am I willing to sell everything, my very soul, for a reprieve from this nightmarish land I now reside in? I groan, coming to a halt before one of the various windows, and stare out at the garden Kazeth and I strolled through. He seems so sweet underneath it all, so genuine and thoughtful. Is it all a ruse? Have I played right into his hands? I've never been more confused in my life. Time creeps by as I wait for Kazeth to return. Waiting today is only marginally better than it was yesterday. At least this time we've had a conversation and we're able to speak to one another with respect. Knowing that he's promised to be gentle soothes my frayed nerves only slightly. He could renege on that promise the second we're alone together. And nobody, least of all me, would be in a position to do anything about it. If anything, ferocity would likely be encouraged by the king and the other demons. It'd be interpreted as an enthusiasm for the king, the race, the orders we're under. Any pain or suffering I might endure would be seen as a necessary part of the equation. Even playing through my worst fears about the situation, however, I know in my heart of hearts that Kazeth wouldn't willingly hurt me. Nobody, not even a powerful Sosgoroth demon, could fake the kind of sincerity I saw on his face in the garden. You're okay, I say, trying to soothe myself between shaky breaths. Everything is going to be fine. Well, what will happen tonight between Kazeth and I weighs heavily on my mind. The repercussions of laying together feel even heavier. I'm supposed to carry his child, a demon whelpling. If all goes according to the king's plans, I'm to be pregnant sooner rather than later. The only time I'd ever considered being a mother was when I was with Toklas. We'd dream up the future discussing the names of our children and the house we'd build far, far away from civilization. Even in those wishful moments, however, I knew that any child I bore would be hunted and in constant danger. At least here I know my child would be protected, even if I'm not. Demons seem to value their young more than other races, perhaps because of their rarity. But the idea of a child of mine having the freedom to make their own decisions, to be schooled and raised in safety and joy, brings a small smile to my face. Even pregnancy wouldn't be that bad, I suppose. I would be protected, looked after, and Kazeth can summon anything I could ever want. The idea of him fawning over me while I'm round with his child only serves to widen my smile. Kazeth would be a good father, I decide. After all, he has plenty of experience with the girls, and while he's certainly a grouch, anyone can tell he loves them with his whole heart. Images of a pale demon whelpling with my eyes and Karzeth's nose dances in my head, and suddenly my situation doesn't seem all that bad. A knock sounds at the door and the blood in my veins turns to ice, effectively smothering any of the warm, fuzzy feelings I was having only seconds ago. My hands tremble at my sides, and I smooth down the soft, velvety fabric of the black dress I'd chosen for this evening. The dress clings to my curves, the plunging neckline brushing against my exposed sternum as I readjust it. My back is open to the air, the long, gently curved opening on the back of the dress stopping just above my rear. It's a more beautiful, exposing garment than anything I've ever worn. I'd hoped it would give me some confidence tonight, or at least throw Kazeth off enough to level the playing field, but I'm not feeling very confident at all as I reach for the door handle. I suck in a breath to say hello, but it catches in my throat as I realise the figure in the doorway isn't Kazeth, but one of the squat Zonak. Before I have the time to feel relieved or disappointed, the Zonak bows quickly to me and scurries down the hallway wordlessly. 
Hesitating for only a moment, I follow him, struggling to keep up with his quick steps and regretting my wardrobe choice as I stumble over the hem of my dress. We twist and turn down various hallways, my heart pounding faster when we draw closer, expecting to run into Kazeth at every turn. After several long moments of navigating through the house, I'm about to open my mouth to ask the Zonak where exactly we're going when he stops short before a massive set of double doors. The Zonak issues a sharp knock before turning on his heel and practically fleeing back down the hall. I watch him go, a part of me considering fleeing alongside him when the doors swing open. Kazeth towers over me, clad in his usual all black. I'm struck dumb at the sheer size and intimidating beauty of him and swallow hard as I try to find my voice. Come, he commands, his voice low and rough. The glint in his eye sends a trill of dreaded excitement down my spine as I obey, stepping inside the massive room. Everything is built to accommodate the seven-foot demon, with a grand mahogany desk taking up nearly the entire wall and a plush, ornately patterned crimson rug underfoot, complete with a sprawling bed fitted with silken black sheets. My breath catches as I look at the bed, and I look away quickly, turning my attention back to Kazeth. He shuts the door with a solid thud before turning to face me. Kazeth's eyes rove over my face and body, looking like he means to eat me. Warmth pools between my legs as I stand there, fear and anticipation building in my stomach. My voice is tremulous when I finally find it. You can check out the next two chapters free and uncut on Kindle Unlimited. Chapter 20 Kazeth This chapter is too hot for YouTube. Check out the chapter uncut on Kindle Unlimited. Chapter 21 Natalie I lay on my side, Kazeth's arm tucked around me as I lay flush against his chest. I draw shapes along his skin with my fingertips, watching the rise and fall of his ashen chest. This is the third time in the past week I've woken up tucked against his side after a wild evening. I'm surprised by how far we've come in such a short time. We've been spending more time and nights together, and I feel at ease with him. It's almost like a true partnership, if I can pretend that I'm not just here for breeding at the demand of the king. But Karzeth has made me feel like it is more than that. He listens to me, and I can tell he cares about me with every touch. If he didn't, wouldn't he have kicked me out last night after he had his fill? He treats me with respect, never pushing me too far. He always makes me feel amazing, and after he claims my body, he cleans me up and tells me to rest. Sometimes I wonder if he would let me sleep in here every night if I asked, but I'm too afraid of our precarious predicament to test those waters. I let out a soft sigh. My life has improved markedly since coming to the manor, but that doesn't mean I can forget about the conditions I was forced into. I may have come out lucky with the kind of demon that chose me, but that doesn't mean that all the demons on this floating island are like him. You're thinking mighty loud this morning. Kazeth's hand moves softly up and down my spine, his fingers trailing along my skin so lightly, it sends a delicious shiver through me. Natalie, he whispers, and his other hand comes up to grip my chin. He lifts my face to look at him. What's on your mind? I chew on my bottom lip. You know that I am very grateful for my life here, right? His eyebrows tip up. And? But not all the humans on Talith are treated so well. Before I came here, I was starving and the Trollvor didn't feed us often. His arm tightens around me. You are no longer like that, though. I feed you well. I nod, propping myself up on his chest to better look at him as he glides his hand from my chin to my shoulder. I just can't stomach living so well when I know others aren't. Do you think we could bring the others food? Kazeth traces his fingers over my cheek. Natalie, I can't do things like that. But you can summon it out of thin air. I have to give some to those who really need it. He slides out from under me, standing to get dressed. I may treat you well, but that doesn't mean all demons will understand why. If I were to do something like that, it would be a sign of my disapproval of the king's treatment. It could get me in trouble, and if I am not in the king's good graces, I can't do much for you, much less all those other humans. I sigh, wanting to protest further, but he's already crossing the room. He pauses in the doorway to the washroom. Get dressed, please. The girls will be expecting us. A flicker of fury ignites inside of me, but I nod. I know that Kazeth isn't just ignoring the humans, 
but that doesn't soften the blow. I'm silent as we go downstairs, but it goes unnoticed with the chatter from the triplets. They are always so excitable, and a pang of sorrow echoes through me as Kazeth snaps his fingers and food fills the table. I watch each of the triplets load up their plates with food they'll only sample, not even hearing the conversation. It's not until I feel a hand on my arm that I'm jolted back to the present. Natalie. I turn my head to look into Kazeth's dark eyes, and that familiar lump in my throat forming as he speaks. Why aren't you eating? I remember the days when he'd snap at me to just eat. But by now, Kazeth knows that I don't do things without reason. I just can't. Valindra, who is seated across from me, pauses in her eating. Is there something wrong with the food? The other two freeze and Alincia nearly shrieks. Is there something wrong with you? I shake my head, my eyes still on their uncle. I can see in his expression that he's begging me not to start this up again, but I can't stop myself. I pull away from him, laying my hands flat on the table as I look at Valindra. I ask Kazeth if I could take food to the other human women. They are starving there, and I can't eat if I know they're hungry. Immediately, Tanulia leans forward and stares Kazeth down. Why can't she? He runs his hand down his face. Natalie, he groans. Well, I'm not eating if the other women can't, Elincia announces, shoving her plate back. Kazeth throws me a glare. Do you see what you've done? You've started a hunger strike when there's perfectly good food here that's going to waste. Then let Natalie take it to those that need it. Valindra's voice is steady. She's always the most level-headed one. We could never eat it all, and if none of us will eat until those starving do, we might as well give them the food here. It won't go to waste, Tanulia chimes in. Unless you don't let her take it, Valindra says, rolling her eyes. Just let her! Please, 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 please! Alincia has thrown herself onto the table, craning around to stare at her uncle. They need food! Kazeth looks around the table, at my sullen face and Valindra's stern expression, and Tanulia's arms crossed over her chest and Alincia's pleading eyes and sighs. I don't have a choice, do I? He mutters, shaking his head. Finally, he lifts his head to look at me. Pack it up and I'll escort you. Excitement flutters in me, and the girls and I scramble forward to start packing it up. In a matter of minutes, it's all ready to go, and Kazeth scoops up the baskets I'm unable to carry. I'm practically vibrating in my seat as we leave the manor by carriage. Equal parts excitement and fear rush through me. I worry about facing the Trollvor again, but I care more about feeding the other women. As if he can tell what I'm thinking, Kazeth reaches out to grasp my hand. No one is going to hurt you while we are there. You are mine now. A thrill shoots through me when he says, mine, though it shouldn't. I am his possession, nothing more in the eyes of his kind, so I force myself to nod. I know. That doesn't slow my heart, though, as we arrive. I can see the looming figures of the Trollvor guards, their skulls jutting out with snarls plastered on their muzzles. I lean into Kazeth as we approach them, keeping my head held high, and he runs a hand down my spine for support. No one stops us as we approach, and with Kazeth's warm hand on my back, I manage past the guards without more than a shudder. I keep my shoulders back, and my spine straight as I descend to where the cells are, feeling proud at how well I'm holding myself, and surprisingly safe. But as we reach the cold floor that I spent many nights on, I spot the cells that once held the women from my camp on Pratheca. They're all empty. I still, tipping my head up to look at Kazeth. Where are they? My heart squeezes painfully. Have they all been given out already? Did the king decide to scrap his pet project? What is going on? Kazeth turns around, striding toward the guard at the base of the steps. The women! He barks in a tone that makes even me cringe. Blue sparks dance around his fingertips, as if he needs to remind these demons what he can do if they don't tell him what he wants to know. Where are they? The king has given the mother accommodations. One guard says, barely looking him in the eyes. My skin crawls at the way he says it, and before I can stop myself, I blurt out, Can we visit them there? The trollver's eyes slide slowly from Kazeth to me, and the amusement that dances in his eyes makes me nauseous. No. Well, why not? Kazeth catches me around the waist, pulling me toward him. We'll be going then. 
He ushers me up the stairs and I glare at him. I want to know where they are. And he is not going to tell us, he hisses. All you're doing is proving how much this matters to you, which will give them ammunition against you. You have to stay calm in front of demons like that. I sigh, and with that, all the energy feels zapped out of me. For all my trying, I couldn't help them, and it stings something fierce. Will I be able to see my friends again? I ask softly, when we are nearly back to the manor. Kazeth's eyebrows are knitted together, and he's not looking at me. I'm not even sure he heard me, and I let the silence lapse over us. Just as I'm putting the thought out of my mind, he replies, I'll speak to someone that might be able to help. And despite my mind trying to warn it, my heart blooms with hope. Chapter 22 Kazeth Natalie looks deflated as she climbs the steps, and it makes my heart ache. I try to swallow the feeling, keeping my face neutral until she is out of sight. Seeing those cells and how tense Natalie was around the Trollvor guard struck me hard. It reminded me of just how thin and grimy she was when she came to me. Not that she has gained much weight in a week, but she has more color to her cheeks, and she doesn't look so frail that an errant gust of wind might push her over. It's hard not to want to help when I've become so fond of her, and if she's this passionate about wanting to feed the other women, then I'm going to find a way to make that happen. There's only one demon that I know of that might have enough leverage to help. I turn on my heel, going out of the manor again, and this time I go in the opposite direction. I already live a good distance from the city center, but this demon values his privacy more than most, and he should. With his new little family, a secret rising with the news of his human mate circulating, I don't blame him for trying to get far away from his father's reach. I arrive in a matter of minutes, and for that, I am glad. I don't think I would have been able to stand waiting any longer. Natalie's face keeps flashing behind my eyes, and I can't take the broken expression on her face when I pulled her away from the cells. I have to fix this. The door swings open after one quick rap, and I grin at the prince. Prince Reg Thorik. I bow slightly. I apologize for coming to your home unannounced. Reg Thorik waves me in, dismissing my apology with a shake of his noble head. We were just going to retire to the gardens. Join us. I follow after him. I've been to the prince's house a few times before, and it has always felt empty. He has servants, yes but it has otherwise been spotless and quiet. Regithorek, himself, isn't known for his hospitality or easy-going nature, so when I see how relaxed he looks and how easily he welcomes me in, I'm confused. The feeling only grows as we slip out into his private gardens. There's a human woman sitting on the ground, and in front of her, to my surprise, is a young demon who looks identical to Regithorek. It seems the rumor of the prince saving his younger brother from the king's wrath is true. Beside the woman is a demon I recognize as a friend of the prince's. I don't recall his name, but he sits at ease between the woman and the forgotten little demon. When the woman tips her head back, a huge smile on her face, it dims slightly as her eyes move from the prince to me. Laura, Regthorik says with more reverence than I knew he could muster. This is Kazeth. Kazeth. This is my mate, Laura. I incline my head to her. It is lovely to meet you. You as well. She stands, her eyes assessing me, but I wrench my gaze from her as the prince starts to speak again. I'm so curious about his mate, but I will keep all my questions to myself, for now. I believe you know Thonir, Regthorak continues, and I nod. He gives me a slight inclination of his head, Acknowledging my higher status, and I give him a flick of my own head. And this is Akos. The prince gives no further information about the little ex-prince, and I do not press. I only bend down, smiling at him the same way I would my nieces, and tell him, Hi, Akos, I am Kazeth. He stares up at me fearlessly. His gaze darts to Reg Thorik for a second, and I see him give the boy a nod before Akos steps forward. It is nice to meet you, sir. I have to hold back my chuckle. 
He is an adorable one, and it fills me with a strange longing. As much as I love my three girls, I do wish to know what it would be to raise a boy as my own. Akos, Laura says, and the demon spins toward her, rushing to her side. Let's go into the gardens, okay? I think your brother might need some time alone. The boy looks to Thonir. You too? In an uncharacteristic display, he leaps toward the little demon, sweeping up into his arms as he chuckles. Me too. Come on, Laura. I stare after them. They fit in so well and they are truly a little family. When I turn to look at the prince, he stares after them in awe. I can see the longing in his eyes, and there is no denying how much he cares for his mate. Eventually, he turns to look at me, and the light in his eyes noticeably dims. I've heard that you have a human of your own now, Kazeth. I nod, seeing Natalie's pained face in my mind's eye again. I do. Natalie. She's a bit more subdued than your Laura, who is lovely, by the way. Laura wasn't always like that. She's come to life here, though. He gives me a knowing look. I'm sure that your Natalie will, too. Give her time. My heart swells with the idea of seeing Natalie play with the triplets and at ease in my daily life. She's already grown more comfortable with all of us, but she isn't as full of life as Laura is. I hope to see her come to truly enjoy my company one day. I realize that I've forgotten to answer, and I shake my head, turning my attention back to Rej Thorek. He's watching me carefully, and I don't know what to make of the thoughtful expression on his face. She may, but her heart is heavy for others. I stifle a sigh as I turn toward him. She worries over her friends. I took her to see them today, and they were no longer there. No one would tell me where they had been moved to. The prince only nods. My father and his secrets. His eyes are forward to where Akos has disappeared to. I worry that that's where he'll leave it, and I don't want Natalie's concerns brushed aside like that. I press forward. I can't imagine they're being treated better, I say. Not that it could get much worse than those cells. Surely you've seen where they were being kept? The conditions are untenable. I don't know how he expects any of them to be viable in such conditions where they are treated so poorly. Normally, I wouldn't speak out against the king like that. I don't trust anyone especially not a prince. But with his human mate and his secret brother, I suspect that Reg Thorek will not strike me down for speaking out against the conditions the king is providing. My father thinks very little of the humans, he replies. They are a tool of his to use, and that is all. To feed them, care for them, provide for them. It is extraneous to him. He can't fathom giving them true accommodations while they are being farmed out as breeders. Perhaps you could talk to him then, I venture. If you agree the conditions are poor, then maybe you can convince him to improve them. Reg Thorek's sudden laughter catches me off guard, and I whip around, trying to determine what he thinks is so funny. He shakes his head, clasping onto my shoulder as he cools. Oh, Kazeth, you'd have a better chance than I. I stare at him, baffled. I don't know how to respond to that and as he recovers fully, he catches the look on my face. Surely you've heard. The prince quirks an eyebrow. My father hasn't been particularly receptive to me since I've taken Laura as my mate. This takes me aback. He isn't happy you've taken a human? I thought he'd be thrilled. The motion that I can't quite place clouds over Reish Thorek's face. Laura isn't what my father wanted. It hits me then. Laura hasn't produced him an heir, and based on the tight clench of his jaw, she can't, and the king is insensitive about it. He says I've shirked my duties by choosing her, and so he won't take me seriously as a prince. I'm afraid any attempts I make will be ignored. That weighs heavily on me, more so than I expect. The prince clearly adores his mate, and it resonates within me. I want Natalie to be that happy, and while I do still want to see her carry my child... It's starting to become for a different reason than to fulfill the king's orders. I'm sorry to hear that, I murmur, and the words sound so sincere they shock me. 
I can't remember the last time I've had a conversation so raw with anyone. I often bury my emotions, but seeing all that I've been struggling with mirrored on Reg Thorek's face makes me want to be more candid. I didn't expect for Natalie to change the way I feel, to be able to wear me down into such tasks as this just to make her happy. But the Prince knows what it is like to feel this way, and he's being punished for it. Visit the Houndmaster. His voice cuts through my thoughts. He's on better terms with the King at the moment. Reg Thorek's voice is tight as he says it, but I don't press. His mate is coming around the gardens and his muscles relax, a smile drifting across his face. Deciding I've interrupted enough of his time, I squeeze his shoulder. I will. Thank you for your help. I'll see myself out. Good luck with your quest. Reg Thorek shoots me an amused look. And good luck with your woman. I chuckle as I turn away, strolling through his house and back out the front. I truly hope the Houndmaster can help. I desperately want to make Natalie happy. I want her to look at me like Laura does her prince. Chapter 23 Natalie I break down shortly after Kazeth leaves. I don't think he knew I was listening, but I felt his eyes on me as I walked up the steps and I heard when he turned to leave without a word. I am starving. I haven't eaten all day, and despite the hunger strike I inspired, I need some food. Besides, I had technically achieved what I wanted. Kazeth did try to take me to see the other women. Making my way downstairs, I can only smile when I find the triplets in the kitchen, pulling out food that had been stashed away in the cupboards. Alincia spots me first, and she freezes with a sweet pastry in her mouth. It falls to the ground, and she instantly looks guilty. I can only laugh. You can eat, I tell her, stepping in closer. I was just coming to get something myself. We were going to set up a spread in the sitting room, Valindra tells me. You're more than welcome to join. We'd love to hear how it went. At her words, my heart sinks, and I'm reminded again of how I did nothing of consequence. I don't know what happened to my friends, and I can't help them. I'm not sure if they see it on my face, but Tanulia, ever the quiet one, wraps her arm around my shoulders and guides me into the sitting room. The other two are already setting up food that had been packed away from this morning, and I see some leftovers from the night before. Honestly, I didn't know any of the food was kept. I kind of thought Kazeth just made all the food appear and disappear. Thank the gods, that's not the case or we'd all be miserable right now. So, Elincia starts as she stuffs her mouth full. Was everyone so excited about the food? She hasn't seemed to pick up on my mood change like her sister, but Valindra squeezes her shoulder. Elincia, she hisses before turning her focus back to me. Natalie, is everything okay? I shake my head, staring down into my lap. Tanulia still sits beside me, not touching but offering her support, and I appreciate it. They'd been moved, and I don't know where. Kazeth left without a word. I blow out a long breath, wondering what got him so worked up. I'm really worried about them, though. I want to help them, and no one will tell me where they are so I can see them and make sure they're all right. Tanulia squeezes my shoulder, and Alincia bounces forward. We'll find them. I'm sure Kazeth will be able to pull some strings for you, Valindra assures me. He's very resourceful. Just trust him, and you'll see your friends in no time. I nod, but my heart still aches. It pains me to swallow this uncertainty, to sit and wait when I don't know what everyone else is going through. Here. Tanulia is so quiet as she pushes a plate into my hands laden with food. Calm just radiates off of her. You need to eat. I look up at her, then the other two. They are so young, and yet they are here helping me bear this burden until their uncle returns. Thank you, I tell them, my voice barely more than a whisper as emotion constricts my throat. Yeah, eat! Elincia is already stuffing her face again. Karzeth is really good at stuff like this. He's super good with his magic. It's why the king picked him to help with the raid on Protheca in the first place. He'll be able to find your friends. I freeze, 
my blood running cold in my veins. Kazeth, he helped with the raid. Tanulia looks to her older sister and then back to me. Neither of them seem to know what to think as my hands start to shake. It's clear that Alincia didn't think the passing comment would matter all that much. In fact, it was meant to reassure me. But instead, I feel shaken. My world rocked. He's a powerful Sosgoroth, Valindra finally says. Yes, so powerful, like this food. I love how he conjures it up for us. He can find the best delicacies. If you ever have a craving, you just tell him and he'll... Alincia's incessant chatter turns into a soft buzzing into my ears and it makes my head hurt. Of course, I murmur, my hands moving the plate from my lap. Excuse me, I just need some water. I can feel eyes on me, but I don't even know whose they are as I slip from the sitting room. Alincia is still droning on, and I hear Valindra answer at some point. Other than their distinctive tones, though, I've drowned out all the words. My breath is coming in harsh gasps as I relive the shocking statement over and over. Kazeth was involved in the raid. He was chosen to help. He is part of the reason I am here. He is part of the reason Toklis is dead. No, he is the reason. A shudder rocks through me as grief hits anew. Toklis died defending the encampment, defending me, and it killed to know that not only did he lose his life because of me, but that I've shared a bed with his killer. I throw a hand out, pressing it to the wall in an effort to steady myself. Nausea roils through me. I gave myself over to Kazeth. I trusted him with parts of me I've only ever let Toklas have. What have I done? I've dishonoured my love, a dark elf of true honour and generosity. And for what? For a demon who was forced to take me, to breed me, and he just happened to be nice enough to feed me. Another wave of nausea hits me. Does Kazeth know? It makes me sick to think that he listened to me cry. He held me and consoled me as I told him of my pain, of something that he caused and he said nothing. He let it consume me, and he was never honest with me. I press a hand to my mouth. I might truly be sick. Did Kazeth kill Toklis himself? Bile burns the back of my throat at the thought because, although I was there, I'm not sure. I remember the demon that broke down the door, touring with my dark elf lover, and I can't truly say it wasn't Kazeth. I know that as a powerful sorcerer, Kazeth had a great part in the raid. Without him, there is a chance that Toklis would still be alive. But the thought that he was the demon that killed my love. I have to get out of this house. I need fresh air and a clear head before I lose my mind. I'm already on the verge of tears, and I don't know how much more of these intrusive thoughts I can take. My feet start toward the garden without a conscious thought, but I freeze as it hits me. I've grown attached to the gardens and would love the fresh air it provides. But I know that when I'm out there, all I think of is Kazeth. That's the last thing I need right now. But there is no alternative. I am in his home with nowhere else to go. I can't leave. I can't get away from this place where his presence is everywhere. And I wrap my arms around my chest, my breath coming fast. I'm standing in the hallway, trying to suck down breaths enough to keep from passing out, though I'm growing more light-headed by the second. And all I can hear is the gasping breath as Toklas's windpipe was crushed. My mind is a whirlwind of memories I don't want. From his smiling face to his screams to follow him that night, it all makes me sick, and I turn around, trying to figure out where I'm going to go that will be better than here, because I have to get out of here. Natalie! I jolt, Kazeth's voice frightening me out of my thoughts. He strides around the corner, smiling widely, and I almost burst into tears looking at him. I have good news! His feet slow as he takes me in. Natalie? Hearing my name coming from him undoes me. It's simpler than I thought it would be, and I turn, fleeing to the only place I can think of. The gardens. Tears stream down my cheeks as I tear through the house, and a sob breaks free from my throat. Just one look at Kazeth, and I'm undone. All I can wonder is did he do it? Did he do it? Did he do it? It's eating me alive, and what's worse is I can't ask him. If he tells me no, I won't believe him. He hid the truth from me before knowing how much the raid cost me. He held me while I cried over someone that he took from me. And if he says yes. I burst outside, the fresh air washing over me, and I suck down lungfuls without slowing. I won't wait around by the manor for Kazeth to find me. I need distance between him and I. My brain is still swimming. 
and I desperately need to get my thoughts straight before I face him. I run until my feet can no longer go, and my shaky legs give out on me. I drop to my knees, tears soaking my skin as I scream, and I pour out all the anguish building in me. I can't believe this. I can't believe he's done this. And what's worse is I want to hate him for it. But for some reason I can't. Chapter 24 Kazeth I had been so eager to see Natalie after being gone half the day, and with good news no less. But when I called out to her in the hallway and she turned to look at me, I've never seen someone look so anguished and disgusted in the same instant. Even when we first met, Natalie never looked at me like that. She might have been afraid, yes, but she never looked so pained to see me. Then she turned bolting down the hallway before I could process how terribly wrong everything had gone while I was away. Alincia peeks her head out of the sitting room down the hall, looking after where Natalie just went, and then turns her head to stare at me. Immediately, guilt and panic flash across her face, and my stomach twists into knots. What did they do? I storm forward, but before I make it there, all three girls come rushing out, practically climbing over each other to get to me. I didn't know. You should have known. No, I just didn't think. Well, now she's upset. At least it wasn't me. I just wanted to eat something. Hush! I can't even keep up with their overlapping sentences, and chaos magic crackles in the air. They actually fall silent. Now, one of you tell me why Natalie just ran away from me in tears. Shockingly, they all stare back at me with blank faces. I turn to Valindra. What happened? My tone is clipped, and I know she can tell I am in no mood for these games. Valencia told her. I thought she knew, the youngest shrieks behind her. I don't know how she didn't know, Tanulia mutters. That's my point. How was I supposed to know that it would be news to... Well, that didn't give you the right to upset her, Valindra snaps. How are we supposed to know what will upset her? You could pay attention for once in your life to someone. Tanulia! Valindra shakes her head. Valencia isn't trying to be rude. She's been through a lot. Okay! I roar, tired of hearing the bickering. This is getting me nowhere, and I don't know where Natalie is or what has been said. It's clear I have a lot of damage control to do, and listening to these three won't solve anything. Go back in the room. I'll deal with this myself. They scurry away and I storm down the hallway, emerging outside. My eyes scan the area closest to my house, but I don't see Natalie anywhere. It makes my heart clench with fear, and my magic rises in response. I need to find her. My gardens open up into large fields on the side of Galmaleth, the red dirt ominous in the dying light, and the black rocks dotting the landscape proving areas of cover where Natalie could be hiding from me. But they also provide shelter for creatures that could swallow Natalie up if they find her first. My heartbeat thunders, and my magic swirls. My feet leave the ground as I am consumed with the need to find her before anything else does, and a small, electric storm gathers beneath me. I fly from my house, my gaze panning for any sign of her. I don't know what was said to send her running away from me, but I will not let anything hurt her. Even if she doesn't want to be around me, I will save her. She doesn't understand the dangers out here. I scour the landscape, searching desperately for Natalie. My magic whips around, illuminating dark patches as night starts to fall. It only increases my worry, as I know that these creatures will come out in droves then, and Natalie won't even be able to see them until they have already snared her. Smaller beasts snap at me as I storm past their nests, and I throw a bolt of energy, lighting them on fire or eviscerating them as I go. My anger is building with my anxiety, and I'm starting to lose my grip on myself. Where is she? I push myself up higher, trying to get a better vantage point, but the yellow grass is high out here. It probably comes up to her shoulders, and she'll blend in too well. It makes it harder for me to spot her, and in a fit of fury... I let out a roar of frustration, and 
unleash a powerful blast on a large rock beneath me. The magic crackles and lights up the sky as I slam into the rock, cracking straight through its surface. It explodes, sending shards flying everywhere, and a massive black patch has been burned into the grass from my rage. It has done nothing to alleviate the building emotions in my chest, and I grit my teeth as I fly lower. I slip through the tall grass, my eyes searching the side, and I try to think as she would. But I can't. I have never seen Natalie in that state, and I have a feeling she wasn't thinking. She was reacting on pure emotion to what? I'm still not sure, and that means that I can't track her. Her path won't be logical, but I freeze, pulling up and twisting to glance back at Tilith. If she wasn't thinking, just trying to get away, she would have charged straight forward. With how distraught she was, she wouldn't have gone far either. Pushing myself faster, I fly up to the crest of the hill behind my house and search for a marked pathway in the grass. It's hard to note in such tall stalks, but under careful scrutiny, I spot a break in the yellow sea. Drifting down toward it, I confirm that it's small enough to have been made by Natalie, and I turn, looking out across the fields. I follow the broken stalks, and as the hill slopes steeply downward, I finally spot her. She's moving so fast that her feet stumble beneath her, and my heart leaps to my throat as I race after her. She can't seem to find purchase on such a rocky hillside, and I hope that it will slow her enough that I can finally get to her. Natalie hits the ground hard and relief surges through me. Without a second thought, I call out to her. Natalie! While my thoughts are a mess of worry, wanting nothing but to feel her safely in my arms again, her face reveals the opposite. Her head snaps back to look up at me with a mix of fear and trepidation, and she pushes up to her feet. I stumble in my descent as I see her take off again, and I see why she managed to stop. A cave entrance juts out from the hillside, giving her a crevice to nestle into, and as my eyes trace of the rocky, black exterior, my heart drops. There is only one beast out here that prefers to burrow so deeply underground, and this cave is its ideal home. As Natalie scrambles down the rocks, I nearly scream out a warning that I'm sure she will not heed because inside, there is a ferocious monster sleeping. She's landed at the base of a howler beast's nest. I beg her to keep running, to try to run to the edge of the island if it soothes her heart, but the gods are betting against me, and Natalie spots the opening to the cave. She must not think I can see her beneath the cave's entrance with the way it juts out, and she skirts around the edge, disappearing out of my view. A scream burns in my throat as I chase after her. I'm relieved I saw her, because if she spends more than a few seconds in there, and even that may be too many, it would be too late for me to save her. Even with me moving as fast as I can, I fear I won't be fast enough. That beast could tear her apart before I even set foot in those caves. It could take her away from me. It could take my children. The thought hits my stomach hard as I dive between the stalks of grass, rocks jutting out bursting as I clip them in an effort to get closer to the cave. Something I haven't even truly admitted to myself. But I know without a doubt that Natalie is pregnant. She doesn't seem to know it yet, and I don't want to scare her or push her too hard. In a few weeks, the signs will start, and we will have it confirmed. With our intense and frequent coupling, though, I had already suspected that she might already be pregnant. But a few mornings ago, I awoke to a tendril of magic responding to mine. It stirred against me, calling to me in the early morning hours, and when I laid a palm on her stomach, it jolted through me. There was no denying it for me then. I spent hours sending little tendrils of magic in and feeling the child respond. It's not strong enough for Natalie to feel, but I'm so in tune with my magic that I was able to register the creation as soon as it started. And I can't deny that I've been thrilled. It's another reason I've become so protective over Natalie, and after seeing the prince today, all I've been able to think about, besides making Natalie happy, is having children of my own. That thought stays with me as I slam down into the ground outside the cave, feeling the immense energy inside. There's a howler beast lurking, and it thinks its next meal has wandered in. How wrong the creature is.
Chapter 25. Natalie. Sobs rack my body as the tall grass sways around me. I'm nestled at the base of the stalks, hoping to hide out here as long as it takes to clear my mind. But I have no such luck. In what feels like no time at all, I hear the faint crackle of electricity and a harsh roar. My head whips to the right in time to see a bolt of blue electricity that I recognise all too well. It's Kazeth. He must have followed me out here. I push up onto my feet. I'm not capable of being around him right now. I haven't been able to make sense of the mess in my mind or my heart, and I can't go back into his house and sleep in his room when I truly don't know what he is capable of. I've never wished for something to call my own as desperately as I do right now, but I just want to get away from him. And if that means sleeping out here among the grass, I will. The hillside is steep, and I start to slip as I rush away from him. My feet slide out from under me, and I tumble down through the grass, snapping off the stalks as I go until a rocky outcropping slows my descent, nestling me against its base. Natalie! My head snaps back to see Kazeth high up on the hill, his eyes trained on me, and the chaos magic that seems to be consuming him, lighting his eyes and wrapped around his arms, reminds me so much of the raid. The choking sound of Toklis fills my ears once again, and I'm on my feet, scrambling down the hillside. I can hide beneath this rock jutting out, and he'll probably keep going, keep looking for me. When I come around it, though, I realise it is a cave, and I can barely see a few feet into the mouth. It's the perfect hiding spot, because there's no way that Kazeth will be able to see me in here. I dive in, not daring to peek back to see where he is, and I press my hand to the cave wall to guide me. It's very dark in here, and the dying light outside does nothing to illuminate it. The cave is narrower than I originally thought, and the walls on either side are almost touching at certain points, but I keep pressing forward. My eyes are adjusting slowly, but I can just barely make out a path ahead of me, telling me I haven't reached the end. Maybe this is actually a tunnel, and it will lead me far away from Kazeth's manor, somewhere that I can rest and pass out the broken memories. I keep pushing forward, hoping that I lost him, when I hear a thud outside the cave. From the entrance, Kazeth's whispered voice carries around the vastly empty space. It echoes around me, coming at me from all directions, until I want to scream. Natalie, Natalie, Natalie. My own name bombards me. Come back, come back, come back. It's not safe, not safe, not safe. I want to shriek, tell him to go away. I'm not sure that I am safe with him, and the fact that he's stalking me into dark caves at night when I so clearly need space from him only upsets me further. Why can't he leave me alone? I grip my teeth as I keep going. I won't give him the satisfaction of confirming I'm in here. He might just be testing to see if I answer, so he can charge in and force me back. Gods, I was such an idiot for trusting him. I knew all this time why he took me, and I don't know how I let myself become convinced that he was anything more than a demon who dragged me away to force me into breeding. I let him into my heart and to take my body, because I thought so, so stupidly I thought that there was something more between us. I have to stifle a harsh laugh. Oh, how I was wrong. The only sound around me is the soft drip as tears slide off my face, the patter of them hitting the cave floor more consistent than my footsteps. I am amazed they are still falling. But every time they start to slow, a fresh wave of grief and pain hits me. I lost the only man I trusted and loved, and when I opened my heart to another, he lied to me and used me. I should have never lost sight of what his intentions were. I saw who he was the first day we met, and I let him lull me into a false sense of security with this act he put on for me. Like a fool, I believed it all. And now, I'm trapped. Natalie! He must be at the part where the walls are narrow, because his voice doesn't echo. Please, come back to me, please. The anguish in his voice must be fake. Damn, he is a good actor, and he certainly had me fooled, but no longer. I can't take any more of his lies and his tricks. I've already given him too much of myself, and he kept his involvement in the raid from me. And for what? To bed me. A gasp escapes me as another realisation hits. I press a hand to my stomach, and another wave of sobs starts to build in my chest. What if I'm already pregnant? It's too soon to be able to tell. But Kazeth made good on his duties when it came to breeding me. Once I let him have me, he took me over and over until he was certain that one of our couplings would take. 
and I have to wonder if it did. Fear sends my heart fluttering, and I tremble as I press harder on my lower abdomen, wishing there was some way for me to know. But what good would it do for me to find out? Could I really carry the child of the demon who killed the only person I've ever truly loved? I shake my head, my throat burning with the concealed hysteria. I want nothing more than to sink to my knees and curl in on myself. It's too much for me to take, and I feel overwhelmed with it all. Natalie! No! I want to scream. Leave me alone. You've done enough. But I keep silent as Cosette's voice gets closer. Just this morning, the idea of being apart from him filled me with anxiety, and now it's his proximity that makes me want to scream. Does he know if I'm pregnant? Is that why he changed his attitude toward me? God's below, if I lost Toklas only to carry his killer's child. It may be wrong of me, but how will I be able to cope with my child sharing the face of a demon, one I despise no less? Every look at him will send new waves of anger and pain through me. And I don't want that for my child. I wanted them to be happy and free with a family that loves them. Not the result of an experiment. What if I can't love my own child? I'll be filled with resentment toward them, and they will grow up without the love they deserve. Am I a terrible person for being unable to overcome this? It's tearing me up inside to think I could be a mother that could turn her back on her own kid. But how could I hold a demon baby when he will look like Kazeth? He will be a monster's spawn. Natalie, please, let's go back to the manor. Whatever is upsetting you, we can talk about it. Kazeth's voice is so soothing that I can see how easily I was sucked in. He won me over with kind words, and he thinks a soft tone and a few easy promises are all it will take to have me running into his arms again. I don't want to come out to see him, to go back to bed with a demon that I can't trust. I don't know what side of him is real, but either one I don't want to be around. Just tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. His words send another wave of sobs through me. I want to be home. I want my friends. I want to be around people I can trust and not have to run away from some demon in a strange land just to get some peace. I want Toklas, and I can have none of that. Natalie, whatever it is, we can work it out. I can't take it anymore. His words, his voice, his negotiations, it's all too much. I feel overwhelmed, and I'm growing angrier with every word he spews. I'm about to lose it entirely, and I spin around, one hand still pressed to the cave wall to orient myself and yell, Go away! Silently I curse myself. If Kazeth didn't know for sure I was here before, now he does. And what's worse is I'm starting to see why he was right, why I did need to come back out. He just never said the real reason. It's not safe. I wish I could have learned it a different way. But when the rock beneath my hand starts to move and a massive figure looms over me in the dark, roaring with such ferocity that I have to dig my heels in to avoid being thrown back, I see that Kazeth was the lesser evil this time. Too bad I picked wrong again. Chapter 26 Kazeth A roar shakes the cavern walls, the rock underfoot trembling with the might of the howler beast lurking within. Natalie screams, the sound echoing back through the cave and sending panic lancing through my heart. I light up the space, sending orbs of light down the cavern passageway, sticking to the cave walls. In my terror for her, I hadn't once considered improving the visibility in the space, lest it wakes the howler beasts. Stupid, 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 I think viciously to myself as I charge ahead. The sounds of Talon scraping against rock keep steady waves of terror pulsing through me, my magic whirling around me, rallying to protect me from the threat. I'm not the one in danger, though. At least not the one who matters. Natalie, with my child in her belly, screams again as I hear the impact of flesh against stone. My heart leaps into my throat, my strides lengthening as I race for her, praying that I get there in time. I'm too far away to send any magic down the cave. I can't risk it hurting her. I'll have to be right on top of the beast to effectively do anything. I come around a curve in the cave, and time slows. For a moment my brain can't make sense of the colors and shapes I'm seeing. Tawny tan, framed by deep crimson and pinned between pitch black and sickly gray, 
specks of gleaming white and more sickly gray completing the blur of colors. Soft, rounded curves look stark and vulnerable against jagged angles and sharp points. Then, everything comes into focus. A half-dozen howler beasts line the black, stony walls of the caves, all pacing and chittering and snarling at our intrusion. Natalie is trapped beneath the biggest and meanest of the demon beasts, blood leaking from where her skull met the jagged rock of the cavern floor, strewn with white, splintered bones. The howler beast atop her snarls, too caught up in its bloodlust to notice where I am at the cave entrance. Its whip-like tail swishes in the air, bony protrusions jutting out from its elbows, haunches and tail, its sickly gray carapace glinting in the throbbing lights I've cast around the space. It roars again, revealing the rows of jagged teeth in the beast's open maw. Natalie whimpers weakly, lifting her arms above her as if to defend herself from the beast's looming attack. Something in me snaps at the image of her prone and helpless beneath the beast. I let out a roar to rival those of the howlers, sending a blast of deadly midnight blue crashing into the beast atop Natalie. The creature doesn't even make noise before it's completely eviscerated into nothing more than a mist of black, putrid blood. The rest of the beasts whirl on me, launching into action before taking the time to assess the newest threat that's wandered into their den. I launch another blast at the closest of the howlers, their resistance to chaos magic only defending marginally against the blow. The beast howls, a wretched piercing sound that earned the creature its name as it careens back into the cave wall, blood spurting as it slams against the sharp rock. In no time it's on its feet again, the pain only making it angrier and more dangerous. Out of the corner of my eye I see a beast prowling toward Natalie, wanting to claim the now unguarded bit of meat for his own. I blast it backwards, using some of my quickly dwindling magic to throw a crackling blue bubble over her, protecting her as I neutralize the herd. The injured howler beast lunges for me again, joined by another, their teeth snapping as they come within arm's reach. A tendril of magic lashes out, gripping one of the beasts and using it to slam the other into the ground with a final, wet crunch. The creature goes limp as I let my magic snap the neck of the other. A howler beast leaps onto my back, a bark of pain escaping my throat as I stumble forward under its crushing weight. Pain quickly turns to fury as I use my magic to launch the beast off of me, a resounding crack echoing through the cave as the beast hits a stalagmite, the stalagmite shattering under the howler's weight. I whirl on the next howler, lowering my center of gravity as I summon a weapon, a gleaming sword appearing in my hand out of deep blue tendrils just as the howler leaps for me. I sink onto my haunches, leaping to meet the beast mid-air, letting my magic propel me forward faster than should be possible, even for a demon. I fly directly under the beast, lifting my sword and splitting the creature from jaw to ass, stinking black muck raining down on me as I land, rolling to absorb the impact of my fall. The beast is dead before it hits the ground. I take a mental tally of the bodies around me. Four, including the howler whose remains are nothing more than a slimy black coating on the walls and floor of the cave. I widen my stance into a defensive position, angling my back toward the wall as I look for the remaining two. They're nowhere to be seen, and I allow myself a fleeting glance at Natalie, who is far too still beneath the crackling orb. My magic is beginning to ebb from the strain of maintaining the protective shield and the lights littering the space, but I refuse to let them go out, entirely unable to leave Natalie exposed until I've neutralized the looming threat. A howler leaps from behind a stalagmite, smart enough to try and catch me unaware, but not smart enough to know better than to attack me. I parry the taloned claw swinging from my throat, swiping my blade up toward the beast's face. It dodges narrowly, a snarl erupting from it as it swipes at me again. This time, I aim my blade further back, slicing through bone and tendon, lopping the beast's paw off at the joint. The howler screeches as it stumbles, slipping in the spurts of its own blood. I take advantage of the injury, sliding to its now useless left flank, narrowly avoiding its spiny tail whipping through the air fervently. I rear back, bringing my blade down on the creature's neck with a sickening, squelching sound, cutting off its awful wails. Satisfied that the fifth howler beast is dead, I circle in place, listening for any sign of the final predator in the shadows. 
After a few seconds of silence, I hear the scraping of talons against rock toward the cave entrance, and my head snaps toward the source of the sound just in time to see a bony, pale tail disappearing around the curved passageway. At least one of them had foresight, I think darkly to myself as I let my sword evaporate back into deep blue. I rush over to Natalie, waving the gently humming orb away with a hand as I fall to my knees beside her, cradling her. Natalie, I ask, not bothering to hide the fear in my voice. I lift her head gently, her blood warm and sticky against my hand, her hair matted into clumps. I send a gentle pulse of magic through her, sagging under the weight of my relief as I find that her heart is still beating. My hand drifts to her stomach as I call her name again, sending another soft wave of magic through her belly. It's silent for a second, blind grief threatening to suck me under, before a weak, terrified tendril of magic answers my own. I send soothing waves through her womb toward our child, trying to quell the panic rising there as I scoop Natalie into my arms. Her already tiny, fragile form is limp against me, feeling more fragile than it ever has before. I move as quickly as I can, rushing us down the passage of the cave and back out into the open field. She needs healing right now, and I don't know how to help a human. Helplessness crashes over me, only stoking the flames of my barely receding fury. I have half a mind to wipe every howler beast from the island for this transgression, but my wrath fades as Natalie stirs in my arms, her eyes fluttering. Shh, it's okay. I've got you, I murmur to her. Trudging back up the cliffs will take far too long, and will only be more painful for Natalie. Using the last dregs of my magic, I gather a midnight blue flurry of magic beneath my feet, flying us up, up, up above the crags of the surrounding hillsides and cliffs. Natalie moans, cringing at the motion and the sound of her own voice as wind whips past us. I slow my flight pattern a little, not wanting to make her or the child uncomfortable, but unwilling to risk either of their conditions worsening while I take my time. Her eyes crack open, hazy and unfocused as she gazes into the swirling sky. Natalie's mouth moves as if to form words, but no sound comes from her lips. Don't worry. We're going home. I reassure her, trying to keep my tone soothing and calm despite the dread coiling every muscle in my body as tight as a spring. My magic flickers beneath us, nearly drained completely, but I push forward, picking up speed again as the manor walls come into focus. Kazeth, Natalie whimpers quietly, raising a trembling hand to my cheek as if to touch me. Her arm wavers and she can't finish the motion. I'm here, I tell her quietly, my voice breaking at the sight of her so weak. Natalie's hand drops from my face, her body going limp completely. Chapter 27 Natalie my body wakes before my mind as I jerk upright, a strangled gasp tearing up my parched throat as my mind is ripped from the inky blackness that I've been swimming. The first thing I register is the pounding in my head, and it's so harsh that nausea roils in my stomach. Every joint through my body is stiff, and though I desperately need some water, I need the room to stop spinning before I attempt to rise. Slowly I recline back, my eyes barely taking anything more than the walls at the end of my bed, it's enough to tell me that I am back in my bed at Kazeth's house. My heart thunders at the thought, but I don't have enough strength to run again. We still have a lot to sort through, but for now, I just need to rest. Here, a familiar voice says to me, and excitement thunders through me as I look to my right and see Cora smiling at me. I brought you some water. She helps me sit up enough to down half the glass, reminding me to pace myself when I just want to drown in it. As I finish, she adjusts the pillows behind me. That's it. Just lie back. You need to take it easy. But what are you- Cora shakes her head, giving me that motherly smile that I came to rely on my first few days in the cells. You don't need to worry about anything right now, but healing. A harsh laugh escapes me. There's too many things on my mind for that. Is that why you ran into a beast's cave just to escape your demon? I bite down on my bottom lip as I give her a sheepish smile. 
You heard what happened? I might have threatened Kazeth when I arrived to see the state you were in. I thought he had hurt you. Giroth had to hold me back. She's always been fiercely protective over others, especially those of us who were brought here. She fought hard to help us when she could have kept quiet and not been swept away from the Houndmaster, though that seemed to work out well in her favour. My smile dies as I digest her words, though. Just the mention of Kazeth sends a fresh wave of sorrow through me, and it must show on my face because Cora slides closer, gripping my hand. What is it? My voice is thick with unshed tears, mostly because I don't have the water to spare in my dehydrated body, and I swallow hard. Karzeth didn't hurt me physically, but I've learned something about him recently that upset me. Those words feel entirely underwhelming in comparison to my emotions, but I don't know how better to put it. Cora only nods, her face understanding. That's why you ran. I let out a long breath. I just needed to get away from him. I needed to think, and I can't do that here, where everything reminds me of him. And what is it that hurt you so much that you'd choose a howler's nest over this manor? I throw a glare at her, because we both know I didn't choose that. I didn't know what it was when I went in. Cora only shrugs, still looking at me expectantly. Well, I say on a huff, on Protheca I had fallen in love with a dark elf. Her eyes widen, and I can only laugh. I know, I know. He was kind, though. He gave me food and helped me help others. He wasn't cruel, and I fell for him. I sigh, tugging at my tangled hair as I try to fight the stinging tears that are already filling my eyes. When the demons attacked, he, Tokless, tried to keep me safe, but the demons slaughtered him in front of me. Cora rubs my arm as a shudder races through me and tears well in my eyes. I press on, though, needing to tell someone that will understand. I learned that Kazeth was part of the attack. The sobs start to tear at me, I told him about losing Toklas, about how bad it hurt me, and he never said a word. He watched me cry, and then I let him into my heart only to find out that he ripped away the man I had loved. She pats my hand. I know that is hard to take. Laura's betrayal crushed me, and Giroth was the one that abducted me himself. It might seem wrong or harsh, but you need to talk to him before you decide to hate him and shut him out. I've learned that there's more to these demons than meets the eye. I sigh as I settle back on the pillows, trying to calm myself. Maybe. Cora issues a small, hmm, but doesn't press it. All she says is, Give it some time. For now, you just need to rest. You hit your head pretty hard and everyone's been worried about you. She squeezes my hand. Especially Kazeth. I want to snort, but I just mutter, I'm sure. He has. He hasn't left your side the entire time that you've been asleep. Then where is he now? My tone was sharper than I intended, and Cora's comes out soft and soothing in response. You started to stir, so he left. He said he didn't want to overwhelm you when you first woke up. I hate the way that my chest tightens at his thoughtfulness. He didn't want to upset me further, even if all he wanted was to see me. I push the thought away as it brings new tears. Changing the subject, I ask, How is your life with the Houndmaster? Instantly, Cora's face lights up. It's clear she loves her demon, and for some reason it pains me to see her happiness come out so unbidden. I wish I could feel less conflicted. Giroth has been wonderful. I thought he was a big grouch when we first met, but like all men, he's soft underneath. I swear that guy. I can hiccup and he'll lose his mind, afraid it's some terminal sign. Her eyes gleam as she looks at me. Much like another demon I know who showed up at my house in a fit because some human girl in his house was sad. My eyebrows pinch together. What? She nods. I guess Karzeth didn't get a chance to tell you before you took off on him, but he visited Giroth. He came to ask my mate to advocate to the king on behalf of the human women, still unmated. He insisted that he just wanted fair treatment, but I eventually got it out of him that he was desperate to do anything to make you feel better after you went to see them at the cells. He found them? The realisation hits me like a bolt of his lightning. That's why he was gone? That's why he was so silent on our return back to the manor, and why he disappeared so quickly. Cora is grinning at my expense. Giroth went with him to seek the attention of the king. Now they are being better cared for. 
Giroth and Kazeth approved of their lodgings themselves, and Kazeth summoned proper food for them. He told the guards to call on either of them if the girls needed anything more, and the king agreed to better care for them, to keep his product from spoiling, as he put it. Either way, they are doing much better because of those two. I bite down on my lip, not sure how to respond. It makes me feel conflicted. I've been so upset with Kazeth, thinking the worst of him. I thought that he had been fake with me, a liar who only wanted to use me. But why would he go that far out of his way just to make me happy if he didn't care about me? He went through all that effort just because I was sad about the other women, women that have no impact on him. How can I hate him when he wanted to soothe my worries? Not just soothe them, but erase them. He went a step farther than I asked, not just feeding them, but ensuring they are being cared for properly. I lay my head back against the pillow, staring up at the ceiling. Maybe Cora is right. Maybe I judged this demon too harshly. I had been convinced that he was only a monster, and it would be easy to label him as such if he was a harsh killer trying to coerce me into his bed. But he's never been like that. He took his time with me. He was careful and attentive and gentle. He never pushed me farther than I was willing to go, and it pains me to admit that I do miss our intimacy. In fact, right now, I miss him. I miss the way I would wake up next to him, an arm curled around me protectively. Even in sleep, he had to ensure that I was safe. How could I ever think of him as a monster, a manipulator, or a liar? I'm back to square one, feeling like my thoughts are more of a jumbled mess than anything else. Through all the conflict, though, I recognise one difference. I don't want to desperately get away from Kazeth anymore. Maybe I do need to face this head on. I can only get the answers I need from him. Turning to look at Cora, I ask her, where is he? He's waiting outside. My eyes flick to the door and I can't help wondering how much he's heard. Do you want to see him? My heart throbs. Do I? Deep down, I know the answer. I'm just too afraid to admit it. Chapter 28 Kazeth Maybe it's wrong, but I've been listening intently on the other side of Natalie's bedroom door the entire time. As soon as I saw her stir, I knew she wouldn't want to wake up to see me, but I couldn't get too far. I needed to hear her voice to know she's alright, and honestly, I wanted to know why she was so upset with me. Now that I know, I can't blame her for running from me. I've done everything she has accused me of. I was involved in the raid, and I did keep that from her. I didn't want to admit it at the time because she was so tentative in her trust in me. She was just starting to open up, and I wanted more. I knew she'd shut down if I told her then. And I had tried to rationalize it. I had lied to myself, telling her it wasn't important enough for her to know. But even I didn't buy that. What am I supposed to say to her? She's still heartbroken over a fucking dark elf when I can offer her more than he ever could, and I was involved in his demise. Do I regret it? No. But I don't feel that piece of information is going to help my case any. Natalie's voice cuts through my thoughts. Where is he? Oh shit. My heart falters. Anxiety and longing mingling. I want to see her. But I'm afraid to. I'm not sure what will prolong it. And if she's only going to confess how much she hates me. I'd rather stay here, mired in uncertainty, than face the blow she's about to deliver. He's waiting outside. Do you want to see him? I press a palm to the door as I lean against it. I've never been so nervous in my life, and as the pause drags out, my heart sinks. That's an answer in itself. But then she speaks up, sparking shock and hope in me. Yes. I have to take a deep breath to calm my frayed nerves. My hands are shaking. When have they ever done this? I brace myself as I touch the doorknob, reminding myself not to barge in there and demand anything more than she's willing to give. My worry is hitting me in crashing waves, and I want to examine her, ensure she is okay. I want to take her in my arms and feel her body, warm and very much alive, pressed against mine. But I can't do any of those things, I remind myself. I need to go at her pace. 
With a nod and a self-assuring I can do this, I turn the knob. As soon as it swings open, I'm struck hard as I take Natalie in. We've been separated for only a handful of minutes, but having her gaze on me again knocks the breath out of me. A soft smile spreads across my face as I take one step into the room. Good evening, Natalie. I try to keep my voice neutral, though it's brimming with tenuous hope. Her eyes are analytical as she assesses me, and I feel like I'm on trial. I've never seen anyone with such a piercing gaze, not even when I've taken an audience with the king. Did you really do all that for me? Her normally soft and sweet voice is hard and assessing. It makes me gulp, and my heart is hammering in my chest. Will she believe me? Even if Cora told her everything, will she think that it is the truth? Yes, I say, clasping my hands behind my back to hide how they fidget. I did. My heart hammers as the words leave my lips, but to my relief, her expression changes immediately. Her brow smooths out, and her shoulders relax as she leans back on her pillows. Her stern expression turns to one of soft exhaustion, and I could hit my knees when she looks at me with that light in her eyes that I've come to love. I think that's my cue, Cora murmurs as she gets to her feet, her eyes flicking between Natalie and I. Not that either of us pay her much mind. You know where I am if you need me. She pats Natalie's hand and lowers her voice as she tells her, Good luck. The door clicks softly closed behind Cora, and on uncertain legs I make my way to the vacated chair. Natalie's eyes track my movements, but she doesn't look put off by them. I take that as a good sign, and I pull the chair up closer by her bedside. Reaching out, I take her hand in mine and stroke along the back. Just, Natalie, please tell me what you heard that upset you so. I may have gotten the gist of it by listening through the door, but I desperately want her to tell me herself. I need to ease her fears, and she needs to know that I won't keep this from her. I heard that you were a part of the raid on Pratheka. Her eyes sadden as she says it, and it's like a punch to the gut. I'd do anything to erase it, truly, and it pains me how hard I've fallen for this woman. You never admitted to being involved in the raid when I told you about how it destroyed my life, and I thought that maybe you killed Toklas. I try not to cringe as she says the name of her former lover. It hurts me to think of another man holding her, but I can get through this for Natalie. It's a conversation that I've been... dreading, and yet... I've been wanting to have it since I saw her with tears in her eyes running down my hallway. Shaking my head, I tell her, I was a part of the raid, but I never went to Protheca. As a Sazgaroth, I only opened the portals for the demons to get down there. I honestly didn't know what they were planning to do on the ground continent. I was just following orders. I lift up to stroke her cheeks. I had no part in taking any of the women or killing anyone. My contribution was barely a wave of my hand, and I didn't tell you before because I didn't want you to think the worst of me. We were just starting to build trust, and I didn't want to break something so fragile. Her eyes shine with unshed tears. You never went to Protheca. I kneel beside her bed, wanting to be eye-level and get as close as I can to her. No, I didn't, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't involved. I take a deep breath barely able to believe the words that come out of my mouth next. I'm so sorry. A soft smile plays on her lips. She's relaxing more, and it seems that she finds my very undemonic apology as amusing as it is unnatural. Why? she asks. I'm sorry for not telling you in the first place. You gave me the perfect opportunity to, and yet, when I had the chance, I stayed silent. No matter the reason, I shouldn't have done that. I should have told you the truth and let you make your own decisions instead of trying to guide you in the direction of my choice. Her eyebrows knit together as I continue, and it makes me nervous. I can't tell if I'm upsetting her by saying any of this, but I press on. And I'm sorry you had to hear from someone else. I don't want you to ever feel like I'm keeping anything from you. You deserve the truth, Natalie. If you would have come to me... I would have rather talked to you instead of chasing you into a nest of howler demons. 
Her mouth tugs down into a frown. I'm going in the wrong direction. But I understand why you did that, I admit, sounding almost resigned. I've never been this open with my feelings with anyone, and it's hard for me to tell her all of this. But I have to. I have to do what it takes to clear the air between us, and then I have to let her make her own decision. I don't blame you for running from me, but I want you to know that you can always talk to me. I want to know what you're thinking and how you're feeling, and if you need space from me, I can give you that. I squeeze her hand. Just please, please don't run out there like that again. It's not safe, and that's why I chased after you. Not because I can't respect your space, but because I can't bear the idea of you getting hurt. I dare a glance up at her beautiful dark eyes, and she's staring at me with that thoughtful gaze again. I wait a few beats, hoping she'll give me some kind of response, but she doesn't. Slowly, I slip my hands off her face and pull back from her. I'm sorry if I came on too strong, or if I invaded your space or pushed you too far. I'm trying, Natalie, but I... I shake my head, looking down at my open palms. I don't know what I'm doing here, if I'm being honest. I'm doing the best I can. Silence is all that meets me, and when I look up at her, she's staring ahead. I sigh, but I knew she wasn't ready to see me. I rise to my feet and maintain the image of stoicism, though I'm so far from it. I'm sorry for intruding when you need to rest. Even though she said she wanted to see me, I still feel like it's a mistake now. I'll go. I turn, my heart sinking with every step. I don't want to leave. I want to hold her, to know she's okay and that she doesn't hate me. I've given that girl my heart, and now I'm leaving, giving her every opportunity to crush it. Just as I reach the door, putting out a hand to grip the knob, her voice finally cuts through the air. Wait! Chapter 29 Natalie Kazeth turns back to where I lay in the bed, his posture more resigned than hopeful. I tangle my fingers in the sheets covering me, trying to disguise the anxiety that pulses through me as he levels a look at me. I don't know what to say, but I know that I don't want him to go. We look at each other for a long moment, the loaded silence hanging between us before Kazeth finally breaks it. Do you want me to sit with you? I nod grateful that he saved me from trying to put my scattered thoughts into words. Karzeth takes a seat in the chair by my bed, and I tear my gaze from my hands as I take a steadying breath. That day was the worst day of my life, I tell him quietly. Karzeth's face is solemn as he nods, his fingers twitching in my direction as if to reach for me. I make no move to take his hand, not yet. Not until I'm sure I know everything about what happened that day. When I found out you were a part of the raid, it was like something inside me broke. All I could think about was that massive demon turning Toklas's skull to splinters. I kept picturing your face beneath all of that armour, kept thinking, kept thinking that you didn't tell me about your involvement with the raid, because you were the one who killed Toklas and took me. Karzeth is shaking his head emphatically before I even complete the thought, opening his mouth to defend himself when I hold up a hand, wordlessly signalling to him that I'm not done. He stills, waiting for me to continue as I force myself to meet his eyes. I need you to be honest. I want to figure this out. I really do. But for us to do that, I need to know exactly what happened. No holds barred. Kazeth nods, waiting a beat to see if I'm going to continue. When I don't, he does, speaking softly and deliberately, holding my eyes the entire time. I did not kill Toklas. I did not kill anyone at least not directly. I opened the portals that allowed the demons through, and in that way I am responsible for the deaths that occurred, but I never lifted a blade or a hand to anyone in your camp. He shakes his head. I did not set foot on Protheca, and I did not take any of the women from your camp. Please know that I would never, ever lie to you about this, he says, his voice turning more emphatic and pleading as his explanation draws to a close. I should have told you everything sooner, and while I may not have killed anyone personally, 
I take full responsibility for the lives lost that day. I'm so sorry, Natalie. I might as well have killed them myself by opening those portals. Stop, I interrupt him, my voice cracking at the raw emotion in Kazeth's face as he spirals, pleading his case with me. I raise my hand to cup his cheek, shocked at the moisture gathered in his eyes and the distress etched into his features. You didn't kill them, I say quietly, as much to comfort him as to comfort myself. I drag my thumb across his high cheekbone, holding his gaze. I never thought you were a monster, or a killer, even when I was scared and believed the worst. In my soul I knew that you weren't capable of lying to me about something so awful, I admit, my thumb never ceasing in its small strokes across his face. Kazeth's shoulders drop with the weight of his relief, and he leans into my palm, pressing sweet kisses into it as he looks at me. I'm still sorry, he says thickly. I'm sorry for keeping things from you, for opening those portals in the first place, for giving you any reason to doubt me. I'll make it up to you, I swear. A small smile plays on my lips at his promise, all sorts of ideas dancing through my head. I'll have to think of a few ways you can make it up to me then. I say coyly as I look at him, letting my eyes rove over the strong, handsome planes of his face. I haven't allowed myself to feel the full scope of my desire for him, how hard it was to be away from him, until this moment. Shock flashes over Karzeth's face for a split second, before it's quickly replaced with a cocky, purely male grin. I look forward to making it up to you, over and over, he murmurs, leaning forward to catch my lips in a gentle, needy kiss that tells me just how worried he truly was. I'll make it up to you for as long as you let me. Later, despite the land of Teeleth being completely foreign and intimidating to me when I first arrived, I've now found it, and especially Kazeth's gardens, to be a particular source of comfort. Silvery Lolanian blossoms dance in the dry wind, the sunlight glinting off their metallic petals. I sigh, nestling further into Kazeth's arms, loving the way he squeezes me closer. So far, Pregnancy has been exactly what I'd always imagined it would be, although I could do with less of Kazeth's territorial instincts. He nearly skinned one of the Zonak alive yesterday after he walked into our room without knocking. I'd suspected the day I ran into the Howler Beast's nest that I may have been pregnant, but I didn't know for sure until Kazeth confirmed it for me while I was recovering. It's still far too early for me to be showing, but little one seems to want to make their presence known in other ways, like the persistent nausea or how quick I am to fatigue. Karzeth's hand wanders from my waist to my belly, as it so often does these days, and I feel more than see a small tendril of his magic brush against my belly. A tiny tendril of magic answers his. It will never cease to amaze me that Karzeth and our child can already communicate, already so similar. I press a hand to my belly beside Karzeth's as I look at him in wonder. You know, I don't think I'll ever stop being jealous that you can do that, I tell him as I rub my stomach. Kazeth grins, placing his hand over mine and leaning in to kiss me sweetly. You get to grow them. I should at least be able to play with them a little, he retorts. Their chaos magic is strong already. They're going to be a little hellion, Kazeth adds, his grin deepening as he continues fanning small waves of magic to our baby. I roll my eyes, smiling as I relax against him, letting my mind wander in the blissful warmth of the sun and the comfort of Kazeth's touch. I should make it a point to visit Cora again soon, I say, absent-mindedly, closing my eyes against the heat of the day. Kazeth murmurs his agreement, only half listening as he plays with our baby. Drowsy from the afternoon sun, I let myself fade in and out of consciousness as we lounge. And after a time, Kazeth pulls himself back, pressing light kisses to the scar that's almost completely concealed in my hairline. It serves as a reminder, he'd told me late last night, of what he stands to lose now, of what he has to fight for. I smile as his lips trail down over my cheeks, peppering kisses along the bridge of my nose and every possible bit of my face. Be mine, Kazeth whispers between the kisses he presses to my skin. Stay with me, Natalie. Be my partner, my mate. Are you serious? I ask, not bothering to hide the surprise in my voice. Kazeth hovers above me, his eyes meeting mine. I've never been more serious about anything in my life, he replies. My breath hitches in my throat, my voice completely abandoning me as I stare up at him. 
Kazeth returns my gaze, studying my face in the silence, before pinning me beneath his weight and assailing me with a barrage of kisses. I squeal, unable to help my peals of laughter, as Kazeth drags his lips across every inch of exposed skin he can reach, taking extra care to linger where he knows I'm most ticklish. I'm still waiting, Kazeth says against the bare skin of my neck. Before I can respond, he presses his lips firmly to the spot, exhaling sharply to make a crude noise. I shriek in laughter at the sensation, twisting away from his lips as he grins and lowers his mouth to my shoulder to do it again. Okay, okay, I pant, laughter still lingering in my voice. Okay, what? Kazeth asks in his most long-suffering tone, pulling back to look me in the eyes, his smile absolutely feline. Okay, I'll be yours, but only if you stop tickling me, I retort, looking up at him. Kazeth laughs at my stipulation to our agreement as my words sink in, the gravity of them becoming obvious. My expression must have changed, because Kazeth stops laughing, releasing me from his grip as he studies my face. I lift a hand up to cup his face, smiling softly at him. I was yours before you ever even asked, I tell him quietly, never dropping his gaze. Being your partner and your mate, it's the greatest honour I could ever hope for. Kazeth grins, undiluted joy shining through in his face as he sweeps me into a long, passionate kiss. The honour is all mine, he murmurs softly. Chapter 30 Kazeth She said yes. It feels strange, almost laughable, to allow myself to be so overcome with emotion. And yet here I am my skin feeling too tight, stretched thin over the massive expanse of my joy and the promise of what the future now holds. I lower my lips to Natalie's again, her arms twining around my shoulders as she opens her mouth to me. She will be my mate, my wife, the mother of my child, mine. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this production, please like and subscribe. It helps the channel more than you know and allows me to release more audiobooks. Now please enjoy this preview of Lich's Love. Chapter 1. Vanessa. One year earlier. The words, words that I can never say out loud, rip through my head violently. This is going to be impossible. I have to stop myself from shuddering in front of my mother, who is looking at me with her usual critical eye. My mother sits in the middle of the small living room of our tiny house with her hands folded in her lap. This is going to be impossible. I want to say the words out loud. I am dying to say the words out loud. My mother speaks then, as if she read my mind. Maybe she did. Or maybe she sees the pure desperation on my face. You failed she spits. You failed again? I lower my head. My two younger siblings, who are in the other room, go quiet. My face grows warm, and I wrap my arms around my chest. I am thin enough that my arms could practically wrap right around my body if I was a little more flexible. Well, my mother shifts in her chair. She looks smaller and grubbier than usual. There's nothing to say about it except that you will have to go back to the training centre tomorrow and try again. I am sure that Paschar will let you in, no matter how pathetic you have been so far. Yes, mother. I keep my head bent, my voice low and respectful. I am hungry. I am always hungry. And I am cold, even though New Solus is warm as it always is. I am walking from the human village in the west of New Solus, to the north of the city where the Xaphanian training centre is based, I approach the base of the hill that leads out of my village, and I sigh as I stare up the length of the hill. I pray that I make it, I mutter to myself. The prayer feels empty, but it is one that I say every day anyway, no matter how empty or useless it feels. I pray that I make it. I am not only praying to get up the hill. I am praying that today is the day. I am praying that today I get through the Zephanian trials. I am praying that today... I get my wings. Because I am not quite sure what I will do if I don't, 
No. I have been trying to gain my wings since I was 18. It has been a brutal trial trying to gain my wings, which has caused so many broken bones, scars and burns. Trying to gain my wings has broken me over and over again. But maybe today is the day. I pray that I make it. The walk up the hill is treacherous. I haven't eaten since yesterday evening. This morning, there was only enough bread for my mother and my younger sister. My brother and I allowed them to eat. My father was passed out drunk, so I'm not sure he even noticed that he hasn't eaten in days. My brother will be fine. He works on the docks, and they'll take pity on him there, so he will probably have a semi-decent lunch. But I won't. It's your own fault. If you had just worked harder, if you had just earned your wings, you would be living a good life right now. As a human in New Solus, trying to earn Zephanian wings, trying to become one of those beings, is one of the most sought-after achievements ever. Gaining your wings means you become one of the Zephans. It means unlimited wealth and recognition. It means you get power. It means you never have to worry about anything ever again. It means your family is taken care of. And very, very few humans have ever actually accomplished this. Most humans who try to gain their wings are irreparably damaged and disabled in the process, and quite a large percentage of humans die trying to gain their wings. It takes me half the day to get to the Zephanian training centre. I am dizzy and cold, and my throat is painfully dry when I get there. I am shivering, and bile rises in my throat as I approach the doors. I can't keep doing this. My thoughts are almost frantic as I slow down. My breath hitches in my throat and my stomach empty as it is, turns several times. I can't keep doing this. I arrive home close to midnight. My father is nowhere to be seen when I walk in, and both my siblings are asleep. But my mother is awake. Maybe she'll let me stop today. Maybe today she'll let me give up. I can probably get a job at the docks, or as a servant. That will help us out financially. But I dread asking my mother this. I dread asking her to give me permission to stop. I dread asking her for help. She has wanted me to gain my wings to get us out of poverty since I was a child. This is the one thing she wants me to do for her, and if I give up, I'll disappoint her beyond measure. But today was another disastrous day. Today, I barely had the strength to lift my body off the ground. Today, the Zaffans in charge of the training, including Paschar, just laughed cruelly at me. Why won't she let me work, instead of forcing me to do this futile exercise? this thing that will never result in anything. I know that at some point in her youth, before my mother met my father, she also tried to gain her wings. She also failed several times. She met my father then, who at the time was a young, successful dock worker. She thought that my father would bring us wealth through his connections with the Zaphans and the Gorgons. But humans never get anywhere on Erisac, especially not on New Solus. My father became a drunk very early in their marriage, and his drinking became worse after my mother gave birth to me. And then my mother had her accident after the birth of my youngest sibling. And her life, as she put it, was over. How did it go? My mother's voice is sharp and unforgiving when she speaks to me. There is not a hint of kindness in it. She already knows what my answer will be. I wouldn't have come home if it had been a good day. Mother. She remains completely unmoved as I fling myself to the ground kneeling next to her chair and sobbing. My chest rattles as I cry silently. Please, I cannot keep doing this. I cannot go on. Please, it's going to kill me. She inhales heavily. When I look up at her, her face is blank. Vanessa, do you really think that giving up is an option? Do you really think you have a choice? Look at us. Look at how we're living. Gaining your wings is the only way for us to get out of this. I can get a job. I sniff and try to wipe my tears away. I can work. That will bring the money in. My mother's face twists angrily. You want me to continue living in this hovel? You want me to continue living among these degenerates? She gestures at the front door, pointing towards our neighbours. I deserve a life of wealth and prestige. She raises her voice and I shiver at the anger in it. My life ended when I gave birth to you. You owe me this, so don't you dare give up, or just don't come home. Okay, I say as calmly as I can after I have stopped crying. Okay, I'll try again tomorrow. My mother breaks into a pleased smile and pats my face softly with her wizened hand. 
I try to lean into her hand, but she pulls away too quickly and I nearly fall over. Make me a cup of tea. She shifts in a chair, and I do not miss the way she grimaces in pain. I nod obediently and stand up, even though my right leg is aching from today's exercises. As I go about and make the tea, using an old tea bag that I stored away for my mother a few weeks ago, I search my mind for ways to get through the trials. You heard her. You don't have a choice. You'll just have to get through it. After I hand my mother her cup of tea, I head up to the attic where I sleep every night. Before I collapse into my bed, I examine my new wounds. I have a gash on my arm that stopped bleeding several hours ago. Now it is simply covered in dried blood, and an ugly blue-green bruise has spread around the edges of the gash. I also have several cuts and scrapes on my face. I sigh as I get into bed. I will bathe in the morning. For now, though, I have to figure out a way to get through the trials. For now, I have to figure out a way to gain my wings and become a Zaphon, without dying first. <laughs>